Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> this is the regular open meeting of the United Laguna Woods Mutual Board of Directors, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. And it's Tuesday, January 9th. We are here in the boardroom. And I will call the meeting to order. We are almost all here. We're missing one, one director. Uh, to start with, I'd like to invite you all to stand, please, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I don't, yeah, Emily's back there. And of course we have our wonderful team upstairs, so the media is acknowledged. Uh, approval of the agenda. <clears throat> there are a couple of, of little things that I will mention before we ask for approval. Uh, under number 12, unfinished business A and B, we are moving those to new business 13 A and B. They really are new business and not unfinished business. So uh, they are in your packet under 12 A and B, and we are moving those to 13 A and B. I think that's the only change that we have. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? No, I have a okay. The agenda. Manuel? Yes. Um, I think that uh, item 11 D should be removed from the agenda because it was never discussed at our agenda preparation meeting. And um, I looked up in the handbook. Oh, thank you. All right. I'll start again. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to see item 11 D removed because it was never discussed at our agenda preparation meeting and it is an important topic. I have a lot of questions about it. <coughs> and I looked up in the handbook as far as noticing and all that. I don't think we complied because I got the package with this information delivered to my home Friday night. And according to what I saw, you have to have at least four days notice. So we weren't even aware of this. Well, this is the fourth day. Uh, fourth day would be tonight. All right. Six. Uh, so you so make a motion removed. to remove 11D. Do I have a second to that motion? I second. All right. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of removing 11D from the agenda this morning? Okay. All those opposed? All right, it will remain on the agenda. Any other changes, corrections to the agenda? We need it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would just like to question one that's on the closed meeting because I think it maybe should be on the open meeting. And, and I won't be able to do it in the closed meeting because we can't bring it back to the open meeting. And that's number 5A on the closed meeting. Now, if this is only going to be a legal issue as far as the process is concerned, I have no problem with it being on the closed meeting. But if it's going to be a discussion on the pickleball project, it should be on the open meeting. Right. Because it's not. It's not, it's not what? It's, it's not going to be an, a discussion on the pickleball. It's going to be a report from our attorney on the process of of the corporate members. As long as it stays yes. with just the process. Right. We have okay. so many new members that mm -hmm. are, don't understand responsibilities as corporate members. Okay. And so uh, uh, we've asked the attorney to bring us up to date on okay. all Okay. I have no problem with that then. Okay. Yes, Andre? Is the process discussion uh, always uh, classified as a closed meeting, or is the process should be shared with uh, the residents so everybody knows that? It is if it is, is, it's a report from our legal counsel. I understand that, but uh, we don't have to have every legal to be in a closed meeting. Some, some, sometimes the legal counsel answer questions during the open meeting and discuss issues in the open meeting. So that's not a pre-requirement pre for closed meeting. I, I understand that the procedures we need to share with the residents so everybody knows 
instead of absorbing residents won't arguing with us we just hide everything under the closed door point of order <coughs> yes Steve. I'd, I'd like to close this and move on legal matters and personnel and those issues are supposed to be discussed in closed session all right I need a two-thirds vote to stop debate and to move forward with this motion all those in favor okay we will move forward we are still working on approval of the agenda I have a <coughs> motion two-thirds eight or seven this is item number four yeah you were we were talking about point order vote oh. for two-thirds is that two-thirds seven or eight depends on which way you round. that's right <laughs> I'm going to call it two-thirds. All right, I need a vote, please, on the approval of the agenda. All those in favor? Those opposed? All right, one. All right, the agenda is approved. All right, now we go to the uh, approval of the meeting minutes for December 12th, uh, the regular open session. And I have to say that there were a couple of Scribner's errors, misspelled words, one punctuation error, that have been reported to the corporate secretary and uh, corrected. So we don't need to go into that. Uh, other <clears throat> otherwise, may I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from December 12th? Maggie? I so move. I second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Well, I will no. oh, because I excuse me. Absent. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Saw the hand go up too late. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> one abstention. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we come to number six, which is the report of the chair. Uh, I have a couple things to share with our residents this morning. The, your board has been working very diligently on our strategic plan of what we want to accomplish this next year. Uh, and if I can get those slides, please, Cheryl. This is a big overview. If you would like a copy, a detailed copy of the strategic plan, uh, you can let the secretary know upstairs and that would be furnished to you. So <clears throat> the strategic plan, next slide. Basically, we found that we had four strategic plan goals. We had a number of objectives under each of these goals, but the main goals that we are looking at uh, working on for this year is to become a board that keeps residents better informed. That's very important to us, and we are going to work our best to do that, and there'll be a little bit more on that uh, this morning. Uh, our second goal was to commit to becoming a unified team. We cannot work in your behalf if we cannot work together. And so we have objectives of how we're going to try to uh, accomplish that. Goal three is to establish a protocol <coughs> for communicating with VMS staff. In the past, there's been a lot of micromanaging under the old managing agent because things weren't getting done. Quite frankly, under VMS, we have a pretty good working relationship, and we want to strengthen that and figure out what is our protocol as board members, not managers, in working with our VMS staff. And goal four was to establish a long-range plan for maintaining the infrastructure. I know infrastructure is very important to all of our residents. We know we live in a 50-plus-year-old community and that there are uh, problems that need to be done. We are working diligently on that. We are putting quite a bit of money towards that. Some people think we should have a more uh, advanced schedule. Uh, some people think that uh, the way it's going is fine. So those are all things that we're discussing and how we can, uh, as a board, determine what is the best for the community. So those are our long-range goals. <clears throat> okay, the uh, other, next thing that I would like to, to mention, I would like to uh, 
Send condolences to one of our member advisors, Pamela Grunke, on the loss of her husband, Connie. Connie passed away over the uh, holiday, and he was very, very involved in our community. He was a teacher in the Emeritus Program, and he and Pam have been uh, great mainstays for our boards in our community. So we send our condolences to Pam on this. I believe there's going to be a memorial service on the 30th or the 31st. Pam, do you know Mary? Yes, the 29th. 29th now? Okay, I'll, I'll keep looking. I know they were looking for a place to have it, and that's one of the difficulties that we have. Our rooms are so reserved that when something comes up like this and you need one, it's almost impossible to find one. So uh, that's what she was looking for last I talked to her. But um, uh, we'll try to make sure that that information is made public for those of you who would like to come uh, to a memorial for Connie. All right, uh, now we go to number seven, our update from VMS, and uh, Director Rader is going to provide that for us today. Good morning. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. And I also want to thank the United for reappointing me to VMS. If I could have the first slide. Is it showing up? OK. And I guess I'm able to control it. We had elections at uh, the board meeting, and the new chair is Marcy Steinwald, and Dan Kenny is the first, first vice chair, Donna DeWall is second vice chair. Since it's a new year, I thought it would be appropriate to review some of the major products and uh, programs that we have that affect us and United. So let me. See if I can get this to go. There we go. Um, we replace the antenna that brings in the cable programs. And of course, that affects the entire community, but it, it increases picture quality. We had our United Solar project, which uh, is designed to uh, reduce our electricity costs for uh, the electricity needs in the common areas. The paving program, we seal coated uh, the paving uh, on our streets and that elongates the, the uh, life of those uh, streets. And we also did concrete repairs where appropriate. Also, when you walk around the community, you will often see markings on sidewalks that are indicated they need repair and that program is being speeded up. The roofing program proceeds on a regular basis, but we're also now installing on the flat roof something called cool roofs. And that is material that reflects the sunlight so that air conditioning costs can be um, uh, reduced. Wastelines, very important project, and we are proceeding apace to um, reline the uh, wastelines, both interior and exterior. And the paint program is continuing, and we're uh, doing repairs on dry rot. Well, what can we look forward to in 2018 on projects and programs? In the past, uh, the management would prepare the bids in January. Now they're going to be prepared ahead of time. So when January of the new year comes around, Programs can be instituted uh, almost right away because you put the bids out right away and, and are able to uh, start the project sooner. Water tank leakage prevention. For those of us who have water tanks in the interior of the manors, uh, the city, I guess, had mandated that we have a device on the water tanks that would uh, prevent leakage if there was pressure or temperature problems. And what has happened is that the BMS management team found a, a less expensive device now, so that will save us money, that can be placed on the water tanks. The gates, of course, we have it five and six, but they're going to be completed this year for the rest of the uh, community. 
The handyman services program, I have an upcoming slide on that. For landscaping services, we have a new manager that's been placed under a new manager, and we should see vast improvements in landscaping this year. Enhanced resident services. Um, last year, in resident services, in the, in the call area, they uh, <coughs> answered 80% of calls within 20 seconds. Their goal is to increase that to 90% of calls within 20 seconds. And that's remarkable because if you'll recall past management, what would happen is you'd call in, you'd have to wait, on, be on wait, and then eventually you might have to leave a message. Much more efficient system now. And uh, let's go on. On the handyman services, a little bug flying around. On handyman services, I guess it's on the agenda today, but the most important things are to understand that it is a voluntary program. If you do sign up for it, it will give you enhanced services beyond those that we presently provide at, uh, uh, for those living in the co-op. And I'm sure that will be discussed further today. We received a recreation report from Brian Gruner. And looking forward, this is some of the things that he mentioned. There's going to be a spring health and fitness expo and new fitness classes in Clubhouse 5. We are adopting a marine regiment in uh, Pendleton. And what that means is that if they get deployed, we'll be able to send packages, letters, and things like that. And in return, they'll be participating, I guess, in some of the programs that we have, maybe at Memorial Day services or things like that. Uh, they also, he said, they're going to enhance some of the more successful programs that we had last year. They're listed here, Memorial Day, July 4th, Country Western Hoedown. And there is a thought that they might discuss with clubs combining uh, with recreation-sponsored programs so they could get increased participation. And at the golf services, they're adding bilingual staff. Additionally, they're going to add card swipe systems at the pools. They're going to eliminate the waiting list at the garden center and have all the plots leased. They're going to have online registration and reservations. And I didn't discuss this with VMS board, but I'm sure they would agree that this is a great New Year's resolution for the VMS board. Working with management, the board will try to uh, uh, contain costs, improve services, respond to the needs of our community. With that, I say, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <clears throat> Thank you, Dick. Um, are there any questions yes. from the board for Dick? Yes. Yes. Pat? Um, I'd like you and Mary to clarify something for me. I believe that when the VMS direct Board of Directors was created, the intention of the board of VMS was to hire people and to categorize jobs and work only in the personnel and yet all the projects, or most of the projects that I saw you put up were what I believe were the responsibility of the United Board. Now, could you clarify this for me? Am I, am I mistaken, or, or are you guys going into our sphere? <laughs> I would answer it this way. At the meetings, we are responsible for the staff and the management. We oversee. But we received detailed reports at each meeting from each of the directors of, um, uh, of the management team. Since you are not privy to some of those things, we try to include some of the things that we're hearing in the reports. It may be redundant, but it's just reporting to you what the directors are telling us that they're getting involved with. So that's why I went through some of the things that I did. And I think it's helpful for the community as well to hear uh, what we hear at the VMS board. I would further add one other point. I think one of the most important things that occurs at the VMS meetings are these director reports. 
And if uh, for the community, I think that they really ought to hear these. And we did make an attempt at the last United meeting. We had two reports um, given, and I think that was is very instructive for the community to hear those detailed reports. Thank you. <clears throat> Andre? Uh, you did a, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much for uh, bringing those reports to us. Um, you mentioned that uh, uh, you have enhanced the online registration and uh, reservation. May I ask, uh, is this related to the class registration and reservation or the facility registration and the reservation? Which one is, because uh, we, we need both. I, I thought that, that Brian was referring to registration of facilities, but I think we'd have to address that uh, question for further clarification to Brian. Thank you. I might say that it really is both, yes. <clears throat> because the classes take up rooms that have to be reserved through recreation. So it's kind of hand in hand. We are not doing the registration for the emeritus program, but we're providing the facilities. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, emeritus class. They have separate registration procedure. I'm talking about the recreation classes, recreation uh, and the club uh, facilities, reservation, that type of the issues. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. So we have both. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That's great. Uh, we, we look forward to see, you know, because uh, I do reservations, and we look forward to seeing, uh, be able to do that online. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dick. Thank you. I would now like to show a video <clears throat> for those of you who were not able last Friday to see. Um, it was two Fridays ago. The, the, uh, the United update on Village Television that uh, Steve Leonard reported, I think this is really an important thing that needs to get out to as many residents as possible about our transparency, about how they can access the information that they've not been able to before. So I'll ask that that uh, video be played. It becomes more diverse. Our community <clears throat> becomes more diverse every day. Mm -hmm. We now have a fairly, fairly large Chinese community. Right. The Korean community has grown quite a bit. Um, uh, many people speak Farsi. We have a lot of people here now from India as well. So uh, in the redesign of the website, um, one of the conversations was, how do we get information out to people who English may not even be their second right. language? So um, Chuck Holland and the IT department took that under uh, advisement, and what they've come up with is that there is a Google Translator yes, there function. Is. Yeah. So if you go to the homepage mm -hmm. on the website, which you will see there it is here, that. and if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page currently, in the lower left-hand corner, it says Select Language. Yes. And if you click on that, you get your choice of Simplified, traditional Chinese, French, Hebrew, Hindi, Japanese, Korean, and Spanish. So um, that's now <clears throat> instituted. Um, the goal now is to remove it from the lower left corner right. of this page. Because it's a little hard to find. Take it all the way back to the top of the page at the, uh, uh, when you first Right, so mm -hmm. somewhere to the right of the Laguna Village logo, and to put it there. Make it a little bit easier right. to find. So um, <clears throat> we're hoping that that's <clears throat> going to uh, improve communications uh, for our residents who really don't have English as a second language. So it's a great feature. Yes. And again, it's something that is, is done by uh, Google. So, yes. um, you know, all the different kinds of technology that's available today and a lot of it is done by Google, it's just wonderful. And uh, Brad Hudson did mention at our last board meeting that uh, <clears throat> there is a new Google Translator device. Yes, It's basically is. Star Trek. Yes. <clears throat> you put one on with headsets, I put one on, you speak in yeah. one language, I speak in another, and it translates mm -hmm. instantly. So we're in line to receive one of those sets 
so that in resident services, when people oh, come in nice. and they don't speak any English and they only speak Korean, any one of our resident services employees would be able to wow, that'll have be a interesting conversation to see. in real time. So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to be really excited to see that because Very it impressive. is the 21st century. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention on the website is um, we redid the uh, boardroom mm -hmm. last year. Finally got it finished in July. And one of the major technological overhauls was the uh, implementation of Granicus, right. which allows streaming of our um, board meetings in real time, mm -hmm. and also to be able to go back and replay board meetings and have the agenda online. Right. So uh, that's now available, again, from our website. Um, if you go to the hamburger bar okay. in the top right-hand menu there, and you click that, you go to residence, and you go to governing boards. Right there, <laughs> it says Granicus <clears throat> e-government transparency. And if you click on that, it will take you to a main menu. At the top, you'll see upcoming events, right? And then below, you see archived. Uh, if you click on United, for example, you'll see the past meetings there. <clears throat> yes. And their dates, the duration. There's an agenda, and there's also the video. If you click on the video, a window will open with the meeting, which will roll. And there's a printed agenda on the right. And below are the uh, items. So for example, if you go to 13, new business, consider members meeting to discuss pickleball, and you click on that, the video will go directly to that time point. Nice. So you don't have to sit there and watch a four-hour board meeting Yeah. if you want to that's nice. hone in on something. <coughs> so that's up and it's active. <clears throat> and I, uh, we're really hoping that uh, people are going to take full value out of this because board meetings are long. Some yeah. people work. Not everyone can come to a board meeting. Mm -hmm. And even though we do rebroadcast them on uh, yeah. VTV, yeah. have to think about that for a minute, yes, get rid do. of the old, uh, and they are also posted on YouTube. This is a wonderful tool. Yes, it so, is. So um, kudos to staff for getting that done. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, and we thank you, Steve. And we do hope that our residents will watch every Friday morning on this day, and again at noon and at 5 o'clock, the United Update. We have a committee chair every week on there giving an update of what's going on in United. It's just a small 10-minute session, but it does give you from week to week what we are doing. And I think it was so important <clears throat> that our residents understand, again, we're not taking credit for this. This was done by VMS. And that's why it's under uh, this report. But we think all of our residents need to know that these facilities are available. So it's very difficult for people to say, I didn't know, or it's not in my language, uh, when these are provided for the community. So I hope everybody will use them. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. If I might just say, um, our current board meeting is live on Granis because right now, I have it up on my computer. Okay. How are we doing? Right. We're doing great. Andre? Uh, thank you very much for providing the service to the residents. Uh, I'm a Chinese uh, immigrant, and I know that a lot of uh, uh, immigrants are not uh, uh, fluent in English, and they are usually coming to uh, us and ask questions that they shouldn't know. But because of language barrier, they are not comfortable in asking questions and uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, that's a great service. However, I look at it uh, because it's direct translation from Google. It's not in the same language pattern. It's just like uh, sometimes people say, Andre, you're not using the right language. And I say, I understand because I learned Chinese, this language pattern. And a lot of the language patterns translated from English to Chinese to Korean to Farsi are following English language pattern. And they are not exactly the way they speak. So a little bit confusing. Uh, and also, a lot of uh, these are just website translations. 
but not the document translations. Uh, a lot of the important things are in the document the details in there. So that needs to be helped out. But I understand that VMS uh, is not in the business of translating every one of these documents to uh, different languages. So I will urge all the uh, uh, ethnic groups, clubs getting involved <coughs> and help out translate all these you know, documents for your uh, group and help out uh, and then understand it so they can understand what's going on there and help understand, make a, uh, get a better life in this village. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. <coughs> Maggie? I have a question then. If the website can be translated by Google, then the documents on the website are translated? No. No? no. Okay. <coughs> They're in word. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's hopefully still to come. I mean, we're making, I think, great leaps in accommodating the diverse community that we have here in Laguna Woods. Is it perfect? No. Is it much better than it ever was? Yes. And so we hope that um, you'll help us to uh, keep getting better, and, and we'll see what happens there. All right, <clears throat> we go to agenda item eight, which is our CEO report, Brad. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Always a, a pleasure to, to address you and the, and the community about some of the great things that are uh, happening out there, and uh, we're very pleased with the implementation of Granicus and the, the idea that, that somebody could be on the first tee right now at our golf course watching your board meeting on their mobile device is, uh, now whether that's happening or not, I couldn't say, but um, it could happen if someone was so inclined. And so if you think about where we were a couple of years ago, it has been uh, light years of travel uh, in a very short period of time, and the best is still to come. Um, if and so I could we, just make a comment there, they may not be on the golf course, but we have a lot of absentee member <laughs> residents who are watching from our website in other states, localities, yes. et cetera, who have never been able to get this information. Yes, that, it's, uh, <laughs> it's truly a, a, very, a very powerful tool that will uh, be of great benefit uh, to our residents. And uh, I'm pretty excited uh, that we're able to put that together. There's a lot more coming. And, and tomorrow night, at, well, actually evening, 4.30, this room, uh, Chuck Holland and others uh, will be discussing uh, uh, village television, uh, our cable services, uh, and a number of other things related to broadband and, and technology. And we're bringing some really, really huge changes. Uh, you remember a couple of months ago, I said we're going to we're going to triple bandwidth at no cost to residents. We did that, and I think we're going to do it again. Um, and so he's going to go through uh, all the changes that we need to make in our system in order to make that possible so that, that folks can, can receive uh, the bandwidth they need to, to conduct their uh, internet activity in a way that, that they find most desirable. Um, so I'm pretty pumped up about that. And then the other thing is a, a whole uh, presentation on our new whole home DVR system. Uh, which is going to bring our cable television service uh, light years ahead of where it is now and provide a whole array of opportunities for residents uh, to not only record six things at a time, if that's what you're inclined to do, um, but also to receive uh, over-the-top services uh, at your own uh, uh, choice. Uh, right now, most residents take the cable offering that we provide and, and, and that they pay for, and, and, and they're happy with that. Many residents would like to design their own offering within the comfort of their own home, uh, when and what to watch, uh, not having us dictated as a cable provider, but having them make choices on their own. And so those opportunities are going to be fully available very shortly, and Chuck is going to talk about that as well. I suspect also that he'll talk about uh, out of necessity, uh, some of our recent negotiations with, with cable operators uh, and, and cable content providers, uh, such as uh, uh, KTLA and some of the things that, that happened there. It is an interesting change that's happening in the cable network. Uh, cable companies are losing customers very, very fast. And in a very uh, strange business model, 
um, they've decided to jack the rates up on everybody they haven't lost. And so <laughs> further causing them to lose more customers. And so that's what happened with KTLA. It was a, an example of very poor business planning and greed. And uh, we elected uh, with, with your boards to, to tell them no. And uh, I apologize for any inconvenience that that has caused anyone, but it was the right thing for us to do. We just can't reward that type of, in my view, sort of unscrupulous business conduct. And, and I applaud uh, this community and these boards for standing up uh, to that kind of activity. So uh, we'll see what happens. That story isn't over yet. Matter of fact, it'll replay itself over and over again as more companies come through. And so we'll have to make those kind of hard choices in the future. That's why I like the whole home DVR so much because uh, we can uh, kick a lot of those folks to the curb and, and grab that content in other ways that cuts out the middleman. And so I think that is a, uh, a really good thing for us to consider moving forward. Not every resident will want to do that, but many will and, and Chuck will describe that tomorrow night along with many, many uh, other things. I should touch on the storm a little bit, uh, though it looks like it's not too stormy out there right now. We had some pretty good rain. Uh, by all accounts, uh, everything uh, performed as it should. I think I reported a couple months ago that we were out cleaning storm drains, and I was hopeful it didn't rain for so long that they didn't get clogged up again in the meantime. But it looks like everything uh, worked well. If you have uh, problems in your manor, maybe a leak or other problems, or you see that, say, gutters or storm drains or other things are not performing <clears throat> properly, please give us a call and let's get somebody out there. You never know when this thing's going to roll back through. I understand there's a second cell that might accompany this, and so uh, it's a nice break right now to clean everything up before it comes back through. I, I have not been notified of, of any severe damage to landscaping, uh, though that's certainly possible when you get uh, winds and rain. Uh, I suspect uh, that might um, might hit later today as opposed to this first wave that went through. And then uh, I did want to remind uh, residents there's a lot of construction still going out in the community, particularly with El Toro and their reclaimed water project. And we've got some things going on out there. So in these wet conditions, uh, it's always good to, to slow down and, and keep an eye out for for our VMS workers and others who are, who are out near or in the road um, uh, doing work uh, on your behalf. So with that, I think I had a, I just was going to go really quickly through this short, uh, short presentation and just <coughs> kind of share. I think uh, Dick covered some of this, and I don't really follow the script very well anyway, so it probably won't be too, uh, too redundant. But uh, your board was pretty busy this last year, and we had just some major, major things that that were completed for the community, and, and I was just grateful. I know our staff was well to be a part of it, but certainly I will start off in, in landscaping where, if you recall, we started the year off with some really bad storms and a lot of trees down. Uh, uh, now, lucky for you, I think more trees went down in third than United, but you had your share too, and so we did a lot of work uh, cleaning up after numerous storms that were sort of back to back to back, um, really alleviated some of the drought conditions that, that we've been concerned about. And I was starting to get concerned again that maybe maybe last year was an anomaly and it was gonna dry out on us again, but I'm, I'm feeling better today that we're gonna be able to continue watering our landscaping and, and keeping it looking uh, a little nice for our residents. But we did, uh, we did do some, some kind of landscape uh, redevelopment efforts as well. Uh, and I have the, the memorial seating area here that we did, which has turned out very nice. And I know uh, we did a number of these projects a few years ago. We've kind of tapered back a little bit. It looks like the board is now, now reinvigorated in terms of, of picking out sort of areas that, that can be enhanced and become uh, areas of focus uh, within the community. I, I think we should do do more of this kind of project, and I think it really does change the character. Um, we also did uh, a number of turf reduction projects, a really big one uh, in in uh, United, uh, and I think uh, that's over by Clubhouse Three, or excuse me, the Performing Arts Center. And you can see that uh, it was quite a quite a dramatic change uh, to that area, as well as. Uh, saving water and providing uh, a very interesting uh, landscape uh, uh, palette for
for the residents, uh, not only in that area, but the entire community. We're doing a lot more of this kind of work, particularly in areas, and we have a lot of mature trees here in the community, and uh, when you put three or four of them together and then plant turf underneath them, it doesn't do very well. And so to the extent that we can sometimes remove that and replace with, with either drought tolerant or something that, that performs better in the shade, then we can really enhance the look of our community instead of, of and, and we do this far too often, striving to maintain this turf in areas where it just doesn't want to grow and uh, reseeding it every year a couple times and residents complain a lot. And so I think at some point, if you're going to maintain really long, large tree specimens, you have to have to make the decision that you're not going to maintain turf underneath them and to move on to something else. And, and we've been doing more and more of that lately. And I, I certainly applaud uh, those efforts. I think for, for this year, again, we've got a, uh, really a new team in landscaping, two new managers, three new supervisors. Uh, it, it's a new team. We're looking at it differently, uh, looking at it, quite frankly, through the eyes of our residents. And what you want to see in terms of, of convenience and curb appeal and safety, all those things. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, positive about uh, our prospects moving forward. On the maintenance and construction side, again, I, there's really too much going on to talk about. And, uh, but certainly, kind of the big hit for the year was the United Solar, um, which was a, a huge project. Um, I think it was pulled off. Uh, given the, the scope and size of it. Uh, I wouldn't say with relative ease, Dawn, but I mean, it, it got done and, and uh, on budget and on time. I think it was uh, pretty well uh, executed uh, given uh, where we were installing uh, the, the panels and the age of the infrastructure here in the community uh, presents challenges, whether it be uh, electrical infrastructure or other infrastructure. And so we were really quite, quite pleased the way that came off. In terms of our ongoing programs, there are just, just so many. Uh, so we talk, uh, Dick talked a little bit about some of the roofing projects we're doing with reflective roofing, and that kind of ties right into uh, the sustainability uh, and conservation initiatives that this board has embarked upon over the last year or two. Um, but there are so many others. Uh, I, I think the, the epoxy program is, is wonderful, and that combined with a more aggressive uh, response to plumbing issues, I'm very hopeful that's going to reduce the, the, the number of uh, damage restoration uh, claims that you have to deal with. Those are very difficult cases, not only for the board in terms of the cost involved, but also you know, residents who, who may have to, to not reside in their manor for a while while we're trying to fix all this. And so I think the epoxy combined with the aggressive <coughs> response to any plumbing issue is going to really pay dividends down the road in terms of, of resident convenience and comfort. And, and we're pretty, uh, uh, feel very positive about, about that direction. Same with the dry rot program. You know, we're, the days of, of patching and painting our dry rot are pretty much over. We're now in the remove, replace, and seal with higher quality and less susceptible materials. And, and the results are quite, quite obvious. And it'll take a few years, because we're doing this with our prior to paint program, but I think you get out a few years, I think you're going to see much less dry rot, um, again, much less uh, resident uh, disease as they, as they see that outside their manor and they're concerned, is it going to leak, is it going to spread? And so by removing that and replacing it with, with better material, I think it's, it's a, a huge uh, improvement uh, for our community. I could go on and on. The, the concrete, and I do applaud this board for actually uh, establishing uh, reserves and an investment in our community concrete for this year. This is the, the first time we've really had a direct allocation for concrete improvements. I think historically those have been done more in conjunction with the paving program. You know, if you're fixing some paving and there's some bad sidewalk there, we have, you fix it along with it or prior to. And now we have uh, really, I think, all the mutuals, including GRF, uh, direct allocations to attack some of the, the issues we have with the aging concrete. I mean, you know, concrete's a pretty tough material. Um, but I think if you get 50 good years out of a piece of concrete, uh, it, it served you well. And, and you have to invest back in it. And so uh, I applaud you uh, for doing that. And the, while 
residents, they, they, they notice all the work we're doing in construction and landscaping, and those are the very visible uh, things that we're involved in. There's a lot that happens uh, behind the scenes, and I know uh, for, for United uh, this year, all the work your governing documents uh, committee did, and you have a, a really great committee um, with uh, current and former board members, highly knowledgeable uh, residents uh, and board members who had took on a number of issues, including amending some of your governing documents, which is a huge ordeal, uh, and it passed overwhelmingly, by the way, uh, by your residents. So I think that was uh, a good reward for, for work well done. Likewise, uh, uh, and probably one of the more difficult assignments is the Architectural uh, Controls and Standards Committee where you know, where folks want to do things to their manners and, and the committee uh, has to uh, make judgments as to whether they're consistent with our guidelines or not. And it, at times, uh, change those, those guidelines uh, to be more consistent with the board's current thinking on, on how we ought to treat uh, manner uh, alterations. So uh, again, tough job, a lot of work. Uh, and I think we've, we've stepped up on matter alterations with our game. We brought in a new manager to lead that division. They're gonna be moving into new space pretty soon. Uh, we're gonna take appointments. And we've asked the city to join us uh, here to serve residents in a one-stop format. And I, I hope that occurs. I know they've been very positive. So a number of good things going on there. And, and I, I hope to make uh, Janie uh, that job much easier than it, than it was last year. And so we, we're with you, and we want to work together on that. And then I think my last thing to really hit, and uh, it's been a huge change, uh, is our attention uh, towards compliance. Uh, we are our community of rules. There are lots of them, and to have this many people live together in relative harmony, you have to have rules. Um, and. Unfortunately, in the past, they haven't been enforced very aggressively, and, and this board, and quite frankly, all the others, have put a major emphasis on compliance with our rules. And so I, I've got some charts and graphs here, but the essence is uh, uh, the year I, before I arrived here, we did 1,400 compliance cases in a year, and now we're approaching 5,000, and, and mostly with the same amount of staff, though, though the boards did agree to add a couple of staff members this year. We've, you know, tripled the amount of work and there's just no way. I think we gleaned all the efficiency we could <laughs> out of the three or four people that were working over there. But if you can imagine, you know, it was really about three and a half people handling almost 5,000 compliance cases. Uh, that's unrealistic. And so we, we tried it for a little while. Now we've added some more. And so uh, I think, um, I think we're going to continue this aggressive approach. And I would, while there are many, many rules, maybe highlight a couple of the big ones, like please don't dump stuff that shouldn't be in our trash bins or put stuff next to them that doesn't belong there. You know, don't plant things in the common area that are not supposed to be planted there or have a thousand pots outside your manor. You know, if you have a pot or two, you might get away with it. You have 200, probably not. And so those are the sorts of things. Leash your dog, don't smoke on your balcony, uh, don't have a lot of clutter around your manor, either on the, on the balcony or, or in the carport. Those, sort, those are the sorts of things that, that your neighbors call us about. I would say 90% of our compliance cases are responding to other residents who are complaining. I really don't have enough security officers out there to detect every, every single instance uh, of rules violation. But I can assure you that your neighbors have plenty of time and energy uh, and capacity to do just that. And, and so that's where this is coming from. And I think they see now how aggressive the effort is. And so they, they know if they call, something will happen. I think that hasn't always been the, the case in, in years past. We've also uh, really pared down our timelines to really the minimum amount required by law. In, in the past, it could take months or years for a compliance case to work its way through the system. Now, you know, it could be a month. 
you're entitled to a notice, you get it, and then you come before the board and explain yourself, and that's pretty much how it works. So uh, if you're thinking that, well, it'll be a year or two before they get around to me, that's not the case anymore. At most, a month or two. And so I, I just encourage everyone, I know you're not gonna know every rule, there's thousands of them, but the biggies, everyone knows, and let's try to comply with those, and, and if you miss one of the other ones, we'll send you a warning letter, but let's try to, to be a good neighbor, get along out there, and, uh, and hopefully uh, not make our folks do any more work than they're currently doing. And then uh, I think that about uh, concludes what I have, but if you look at, at what you're doing in all these areas, and I didn't even mention things like pushmatics, uh, replacing the, uh, the, uh, the old uh, electric panels, or, or the thousand water heaters that we're looking to replace, for next year, it's a it's a it's a huge body of work that you've undertaken. Much of it uh, neglected for many years for a variety of reasons, um, but you haven't neglected it. You haven't kicked the can down the road. You stepped up to the plate, and now we're going to fix a lot of these things that that uh, have not been taken care of. I know residents worry a lot about the big project they hear about. Oh my gosh, there's there's pickleball, there's this or that, and those are good things to worry about. But I think we do have to have some perspective. Um, those are pretty small things compared to the investments this mutual is making in terms of dry rot and epoxy lining and water heaters and all those. They, they dwarf uh, any expenditure on those sorts of projects that tend to get uh, a lot of note in the community. So I just, I'll be, I'll be on TV6, or excuse me, Village Television, on Thursday talking about some of that. But I think it's important to note that, that by and large, 90, 95% of the, the money that's invested in construction or maintenance activities is really maintenance. Uh, it is fixing things that need to be fixed and not building new extravagant things. We just don't do a whole lot of that. So with that, I would answer any questions you have. Thank you. <clears throat> Does the board have any uh, questions for him? Cash? Uh, I just thought, uh, if you go to Channel 5, it still says that we are trying to negotiate with them. I think at 170% increase, we don't need to renegotiate with them. Just tell them no more. Take that message out. We we're pretty far apart, <laughs> to say the least. Right. Also, our handyman could install this air antennas that air waves are free. And it'll be less than $50 worth of work. And it'll be something for our handyman service to start out with. Well, I don't want to steal Chuck's, Chuck's thunder, but you're right, we are pretty far apart. Uh, it's probably unlikely there's a middle ground there, though we're always open to have those discussions. Um, very shortly, it may have occurred already, you'll just go from four to six without the, the pause at five. It's just a matter of easy programming and, and that's what we'll do. Um, but yes, you're right. Uh, KTLA is available over the airways with a, with a set of rabbit ears, you can pick it up. And quite frankly, a lot of the newer TVs have digital antennas built within them and so all you have to do is switch it on and you can pick it up. So uh, I don't know how many people out there are um, uh, desperate to get KTLA, but if they are, there's a number of ways to get it, including on their website as well. Oh, yeah, if you want to write on their website. So I'm sure Chuck will talk about all that stuff uh, tomorrow, um, uh, but uh, we find that um, negotiating uh, strongly for our residents is the right approach, not only with respect to, to cable television, which I have to tell you, those are difficult negotiations because uh, they have most of the leverage. You know, if you want what they offer, you pay or you don't get. And maybe they'll come down a little bit. It happens. We negotiate down with them, but not a lot. Um, not like, say, a vendor or a contractor here where we, we work over pretty good and we get the best possible price for our residents. Um, this is a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of technical legal issues involved. and. Uh, and a lot of market power held by the owners of this content that we want to acquire for our residents. So uh, it's a little different negotiation that we typically do, and that's why we, we bring in specialists to help us uh, uh, with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Andre? 
Uh, thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, report on the uh, residents' life, uh, how things have improved for us. Um, a few questions that I have, but I want to just uh, uh, focus on one issue at this point. Uh, we had this Arbor software implemented uh, for over a year now, and uh, I haven't been, uh, and, and uh, this is a specific for landscape. I thought this Arbor software is supposed to reduce the staff time, helping them make their job more efficient. But turned out the last year, we weren't uh, able to uh, even meet our own requirements. So what is the benefit of this Arbor software? Uh, from what I've heard is that uh, it gives an inventory of how much money we have with the, our uh, plants in this community. But that's the, not the most important thing to the uh, residents. What we wanted to find out is, uh, how much time does it save the staff? In turn, how much time does uh, work have they accomplished for us? And how much assessment has been uh, reduced or even improved the quality? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. So what is the advantage of this Arbor software? Uh, can we provide some information on that, uh, help uh, residents understand uh, you know, the benefit to our residents, saving the assessment, improve the quality? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Um, the implementation of that happened kind of mid-year, and so we're just now, of course, we've had other issues with landscaping that probably haven't allowed us to, to move forward as aggressively with this as we can. But there, there are really a number of benefits, and I'll start with the most obvious is, is really one of risk management, that if you, if you know exactly when and how you maintain a particular say tree species, and it's in the system, then if you have some, some event that happens uh, with that tree that would cause liability, then you're better positioned uh, to defend yourself. So that's, that's a piece of it, and that is why, why cities uh, implement this kind of a software program so they can document everything they've done to a particular a tree so that if there is uh, some sort of accident or tragedy that happens with respect to it, then they can prove uh, how they've maintained it. Also, I think, and our residents really love their trees, and uh, just try to take one out, and you'll find out how much they love them. Um, and so having this information in a database available for residents so that they can can uh, understand and have more information about a particular tree species that may be in their yard or one that they find particularly appealing, I think that is also important. It's, it's a, a more of a cultural benefit, and I think the idea is to have this on, on the website so that residents can access it as well. And so we're working towards that. And then lastly is, is, is what you talk about, which is how do we use this system to more efficiently uh, maintain uh, our urban forest. And I think that is, I wouldn't say it's the most important one, but I think for, for those of us who put it in place, it probably is, um, because we're very concerned about uh, over trimming. A lot of folks think, well, gee, we're, we over trim these trees. If they're blocking your view, you think we're under trimming. Uh, and so we've got requests now to top a number of trees to, to preserve view sheds. And so that's something I would never recommend, um, and, and we don't do. And so by using this tool, I think we can, can set uh, uh, trimming schedules and guidelines that are more not only respectful of the species, but some of the geographical areas where they're located so you can deploy the staff in a more efficient manner. I think that's really uh, the piece that we need to glean out of here. And again, we've been a little bit uh, just behind. And so I think we, we're still maintaining our fairly traditional uh, geographical trimming approach. But I see over time a little bit of a shift away from that. A shift that some residents won't like because certain species won't be trimmed as often. We won't trim every tree every three years just because we're here. But we're in the cul-de-sac, trim it. Um, that tree may not be trimmed because it doesn't need to be trimmed but every five years. And so those are the kind of, I think, changes we'll be able to make. Uh, I do want to point out, since you brought up trees, we don't top trees. <laughs> trees are, I shouldn't say that, we do top them if they're diseased. For example, bark beetle typically hits the top of a pine tree. And so in an effort to get a few more years out of those trees, sometimes we'll take off the, 
the apparent diseased portion and, and try to maintain the tree a little bit longer. But in actuality, when a tree's got bark beetles, cutting the top off of it is probably not going to save it. It is probably going to go anyway. And a better approach is probably just to remove the thing. We do have a problem, though, about residents hiring tree trimmers on the weekends and topping our trees so they get a better view. And so when residents call uh, with those kinds of problems, um, for example, I, I had one a couple weeks ago. You, why are you topping these trees? Well, we didn't top them. They weren't pine trees. They weren't bark beetle infested. And so it comes to note that a resident on their own on a weekend uh, tops and trees. That is a very severe uh, rules violation. And, and we urge you, please, do not, do not top our trees. Uh, and this is a huge investment. If you look at the value of the assets that we have in this community, you may have more value in trees than you do in clubhouses. It's a pretty big number. Um, and so I would say, you know, please, please don't top our trees. Um, uh, we're, we're pretty studious about their care and maintenance. Uh, and, and topping is only done in the most uh, dire situations, usually involving uh, resident safety or disease. And so, and in that case, usually my recommendation would be to remove, uh, not to top. But uh, I know residents and board members feel differently about that at times, and, and it's reasonable to do so. Any other questions for the general manager? Yes, Maggie. <coughs> the cool top roofs are done in rotation in the normal roofing rotation so that you're not going to go out and do cool tops to a bunch of places that were just re-roofed last year or so. No, that's you correct. Keep them on the same schedule. Maybe as they, as they come up. Right. Um, now, I suspect a lot of these are replacing flat tar roofs. That's typically what you get there. And uh, the cool roofs have a longer lifespan than flat tar. So I think you could expect um, that uh, over time that your cost would go down. I think they perform better than the tar roofs as well, which, you know, if you see that guy with a bucket of tar and a mop running around, uh, take a picture of him because he's not going to be here much longer. Um, so, yeah, I think you'll notice much better performance, lower cost. Uh, and then, of course, the energy savings that come along with that as well. So it, overall, it's just a much better product. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Raisa? <coughs> yeah. You mentioned the compliance issue has gone up. Uh, and you mentioned the cases. In the, in the committees I have been, for example, alteration, I think the process is too slow. I don't know is lack of staff or lack of knowledge. It for a simple thing, it takes two, three months for them to complete this. This is an area that has to be looked at because people complain, they go to compliance, and those compliances are more serious than just cigarette smoking. So they have to be looked at. The other thing uh, I looked at, you mentioned about Pushmatic project. And I have looked at this particular project in detail. And I think the recommendation given by staff was wrong. This is a waste of time. Is we put two million dollars there, it's gonna increase to four million and it can be used. The reason is that first they have to uh, clear the bottleneck. Our bottleneck is Edison. We first have to talk to Edison to see if they are going to increase uh, the capacity at any time and is it feasible for them? Because it's not just what they want, it's also the generation capacity, distribution capacity, etc., which comes into business. So we've changed about three, four hundred units now over, I don't know how much, but last time I looked was $500,000, and we cannot use this thing. I'm sorry, Madam, Madam Chair, point of order. Um, I thought we were addressing the CEO's report, not issues of maintenance or construction. 
that we take under a normal business through our committees. So I would ask that we move on. You correct. So <clears throat> we will move on. Uh, Why? We can I, get that I, I have time to talk. I need time to talk. You cannot silence everybody. No, but you need to talk in the right air. This isn't uh, as to do with our CEO's report. And there was nothing in our CEO. Yeah, report I'm responding about to that. CEO. I'm responding to his achievement. He said pushmatic, and I'm saying it was not an achievement. It was a waste. That's your opinion. Yes, and he's okay. taking you have it in that to look at it. You have stated so that opinion. So why are you interfering? <laughs> because it doesn't belong. You si you silencing everybody that doesn't agree with you. We need to go on with our agenda. Go ahead. Question about Andre, you have already spoken <clears throat> on this particular agenda item. Yeah, I cannot speak with the president. Yeah. This board is participating in any comments. I call. I, I call for the agenda. Right. So we're not talking about it. We cannot ask any more questions. You had your turn. It's supposed to be one person, one one time. Where is that statement on the there. agenda? All right. We'll go over that later. Oh, I just trying to compliment the CEO's report. You did that, and that's that's fine. You don't need to speak again. Well, and that's definitely All right. Uh, we'll go to agenda item number nine, and that's the open forum. And before we will do that. <clears throat> Uh, hopefully you have signed up with um, Cheryl, our corporate secretary, if you want to speak. Uh, I'm just to prelate to <coughs> uh, start this off, I'd like to let you know that the presidents and vice presidents of the, all of the mutuals met yesterday. And one of the things that was brought up, and I throw this out to our residents if to see what your feelings in on on this, they would like to move the open forums to the end of the meeting rather than the beginning of the meeting. And there are a number of different reasons. One is people speak in the member comments, the open forum, and then they leave before they ever get the answers. Or the answers are part of the uh, agenda on our, on our uh, uh, talked about in various committee reports, et cetera. Uh, secondly, a couple of the presidents were concerned that the image that we portray to our residents in our open meetings is a very negative one because it seems like the only people who have comments are negative comments. And so people who turn in just hear the first part and turn it off don't hear the answers to those questions and don't uh, get the more positive reinforcement. So it's something we will, has not been decided, but I just wanted to let you know that we are looking at that. And as residents, if you have strong feelings about that one way or the other, uh, you need to get in touch with us. Uh, so I will open it up, the open forum, <clears throat> three minutes per speaker. You can address the board on items that are not on the agenda and within that are in within the jurisdiction of this board of directors. So if they are under the jurisdiction of a different board, say VMS or GRF, they are not things that we need to discuss here. And maximum time limit of three minutes, and you can address the board only once during this period. Cheryl, who's our first? Our first speaker is Maxine McIntosh. Good morning. And Steve, I really appreciated that wonderful report. Let's see now, was it called Star Trek? <laughs> yes. Star Ho? Star Trek. Star Trek. OK, I think I'll, that I'll remember it now. Um, on the idea of moving uh, members' comments to the end of the meeting, I do know some people, yeah, every time there are people who leave. That's true. It happened when I was on the board without waiting for the reply. But some of them go home and turn it on TV. Uh, and, or listen to it again in the evening. Um, I, I would just suggest that on the front of the agenda where it talks about what you can do and how long you speak, that the second sentence say, please wait until everyone's finished to hear the board reply to the members' comments. Maybe add that to that paragraph. 
Um, the corporate members meeting coming up near the end of this uh, month. This is an opportunity for all of you to scale down the big pickleball uh, plan by GRF. When plans for amenities become much bigger and much grander than necessary, costs, if you notice through history, often rise 100% or more. And the maintenance cost of that facility stays high. It doesn't drop. It stays higher from then on. The, um, exa one example is the, uh, the beautiful Village Greens. We had a little tiny golf starter building originally there that was used for years and years and years. And uh, the bad thing was it was a slope and their people were being injured. So therefore, it was time to replace it. And then the plan became bigger and bigger and grander and grander. And nobody doubts that it isn't beautiful. And a lot of people liked the restaurant. It was supposed to be a snack bar, and at the last minute, it was changed to a restaurant. A lot of people, I enjoy it. I use it, too. I'm giving my daughter's birthday party there. We all can appreciate it. But we're also all paying for that higher cost for the rest of our lives and the higher maintenance costs. And right now, each United member pays almost $2,400 a year to GRF to maintain these amenities. And the reason GRF has been able to keep their costs down is over the last six years, they've raised the facility fee three times. So the facility fee kind of became the bank for GRF, and that's how they kept our assessments, uh, assessment increases very reasonable. Um, and then the idea that you cannot renovate pickleball where it is because the court is cracked. Hey, look at the laundry room floors, bad cracks. Look at the sidewalk cracks. Look at the cracks in our patios. Every one of our manors in the village is built on cement. And there's probably cracks, cracks, cracks all over. That's the way it is in California. It doesn't mean the building, we haven't had one fall down yet. Doesn't mean the building's going to fall down. And if it did, that you couldn't build again in that area. So I'm not worried about the cracks. Uh, when the uh, general manager tells us twice that we uh, have a budget of three, um, over three and a half million a year just for golf, we don't want to open it to the public. We want to have something affordable for everyone. So please cut that down. Not get rid of it, but cut it down when you have the chance. All right. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Uh, next. Our next speaker is Mary Stone. Mary Stone, 356C. I just want to clarify for Andre that the club registrations for their activities is not what we were talking about when, when Dick mentioned the online registrations and reservations. Clubs' activities are their, their own activities. We're talking about a recreation function, be it a class or be it a, a function, other function. Uh, as far as... Um, the uh, open forum being put at the end, I think that would be a real disservice to, to people who want to express themselves. Um, when we had a forum a number of years ago, Karen Conlon uh, came and discussed it, and generally she recommended that you put it in the very beginning, even almost before you start the official meeting, so that they have an opportunity to speak to the board, you know, and, and, and it's not about the subjects that are on the agenda. It's, you know, other subjects, other matters. A lot of our people do not understand that, that maybe they could be best served by going to a committee meeting to handle their, their individual issues or maybe go to the resident uh, resolution or information committee, too. So I really think that putting it at the end would really be a disservice. Thank you. Noticed. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Roberta Burke. <clears throat> Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to another, hopefully, much more comfortable and quiet year. <laughs> um, I, too, would like to urge you not to put the comments at the end of the meeting. I think that it has already been prolonged because we're doing VMS speakers and CEO speakers and so forth before. I think that there's a lot of people who have something to say, valid or not valid, um, who want to come here, who have busy days, who may work, and it's easier for them to take time off before they leave, um, before they start the day. I think that the issue of 
listening to very negative stuff as opposed to positive stuff. I mean, face it, who would want to sit here all day to tell you something positive that's supposed to be? People would rather be at the beach or doing their thing. Nobody wants to come here to say, hey, you did a great job. If they happen to be here for something else, well, then maybe they will. But it's always going to be those negative things. And quite frankly, I'm living here for 20 years, and it's been very, very rare that I have seen a board member in any of the social places that I go. Um, maybe once in a while I see somebody at a movie but, or the comedy club, but it's been rare. So individual board, uh, residents don't necessarily have the opportunity to get the ear of the board. And I think it's really important. I think cutting it off makes it seem like you're not interested and putting it at the end of the meeting. Because if you put it at the end of the meeting, we, nobody knows what time to get here. So please, please leave that at the beginning of the meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Anybody else? Cheryl? Our next speaker is Michael Landry. Speaking of negatives and positives, 693B, by the way. Um, thank you all for doing the work you do. Again, every time I come here, I want to thank you for putting up with the abuse that you get. Uh, but I'm not going to abuse you today. My question is simply traffic. Do we have different traffic rules in the village than the rest of the California and the world? Yes. Do we? Mm -mm. <laughs> I, my wife and I walk two, two and a half, three miles every day. We cross Sevilla right at the creek to go to the, uh, the creek walk, as I call it. And every day we have to sit and wait for four, five, six, ten cars sometimes. They will not stop. My impression of California rules of the road is that somebody steps off the curb, you stop and let that person by. Not here. They try to run you down. You know, and as we get older, we're getting slower and slower, dang nabbit. So can we have some kind of education to the, what I call inmates of the village about traffic rules? You know, I, it's crazy. No, there's no, there's no um, crosswalk there, but maybe there should be more crosswalks across. And I'm probably the one who's going to get the first fine. But Sevilla, on the way to Gate 4, is a racetrack, an absolute racetrack. I wish I had a little, a little radar gun to see how fast <laughs> these people are going. You see Granny, who's 85, 95 years old, going right through. Slow it down, for God's sake, especially that area. Yeah, it's downhill. It's easy to speed. But you got to watch us. Don't run over us, please. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Cheryl. Our last speaker is Dick Rader. Dick Rader, 270D. One of the reasons that we have a board meeting is to hear residents' concerns, and um, I think we shouldn't characterize them as negative. They're concerns. And the way that uh, you can project a more positive image is how the board responds. And so I think that's very important to continue to have these uh, concerns expressed and keep them in the same place that you have it now. Thank you. That's all we have on, on the, the open forum. All right. We will go <clears throat> to item number 10 on our agenda, which is response to the open forum speakers. Uh, is there anybody on the board who would like to respond? Cash? Uh, I, I have, I'm on the traffic committee, and we do watch speedsters, and we do have fines that are pretty stiff. Now, it is granted, you know, we, we don't need separate rules, and pedestrians have the right of way. And uh, if you, you do find something, get those license plates down and bring them to us, and we'll make sure that they're at least aware of, made aware of, and ticket it if necessary. Points of information, I don't know if I'm out of order or you're not, but it's a really important you're out of order. Well, when Sorry. do I have a chance to ask a question regarding laws and regulations uh, conflicting with the state? Well, <coughs> Where do I go? 
Send a letter. You go to security. And our, to our, to our traffic hearings, which are there, we have online, we have all of the traffic regulations listed. <clears throat> we have that whole policy. Is that for United? Yes, also? for everybody. It's for the community. We don't do just United. That's one of the things that we have combined for the whole community. <clears throat> Manuel? Yes. I'd like to uh, respond to several different comments made by the participants here. First, on uh, your concern with uh, the speed of the cars, I think we're doing all we can about that, but you're right, it's gonna happen, okay? Now, I happen to live on Avenida Sevilla, very close to the creek. My address is Mallorca, but I'm on Sevilla. And about three months ago, they installed these signs, and most people don't even see them because either a tree is covering them or whatever. They install a sign on each side of the street that created somewhat of a crosswalk there. However, there's no painted crosswalk. So I have been waiting to see how long it's going to take management to recognize that there should be a crosswalk there. Any place you put up a sign creating a cross lane, we'll say, okay? Because the law here, you might have a few rules as far as speed limits and all that, but basically you're still under the rules that you have for driving out in the highway. So if you step off and you don't have a, a marked crosswalk, the pedestrian doesn't have the right of way. However, the driver should be aware of that person being out in the street. I don't believe you have the right of way unless it's a marked crosswalk, whether you're in Laguna village, village or outside, okay? So I only bring this up because yes, we should probably have a crosswalk there. So I'm sure Brad is taking this down and we'll follow up on that. Any other places that we have signs that create somewhat of a crosswalk, we should paint a crosswalk. And maybe we'll start there. Now, as far as changing the placement of the uh, open forum, I totally agree with you. It should be up near the front because that makes all the sense of the world. That way we can hear what you have to say. And yes, I unfortunately, most of the participants that come with a remark will probably have something in to say, but we, we should listen to them. I speak to neighbors all the time. They complain about a number of things, and if I can placate them, I will. But if they have a legitimate concern, I say, well, why don't you go to the meeting so that we can hear what you have to say as men or owners, and then see if we can address your concerns. So that's my answer to some of your questions. And with Maxine, I agree with you. We need to watch our costs. We have a, a corporate members meeting coming up. We'll do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Pat? Uh, yes, I would like to respond to Maxine, Mary, Roberta, and Dick, all of whom I totally agree with what they said. Uh, I am very upset that a bunch of presidents would get together and decide things like this so important to us without even us directors being involved in it. In fact, I don't think that those meetings are legitimate meetings, and I think that they would be against the Davis-Sterling Act. Moreover, it is my very strong opinion that these board meetings are, in fact, for the members. So to be putting these questions of theirs at the end is ridiculous. And these people come because they are very concerned, as Dick said. It's the concerned citizens that get out here and they <coughs> talk and say what they want to say. They have every right to say it. It is the members' meeting, and presidents certainly have no right to be dictating to the board, to this board here. Thank you. Andre? Uh, there's a lot of uh, com great comments made that in the past, and I want to reiterate on the uh, uh, comments that uh, uh, we receive a lot of negative comments. I think that's the nature mm -hmm. of business. You go to any con uh, business, there's a customer service area. If you ask them what kind of percentage of comments you have, 99% of negative comments. And don't take it uh, as personally as negative comments. 
It is the way that customer tells you they want an improvement. They like your environment. They like your store. They like this organization. They want improvement. If we look at that perspective, it's a totally positive uh, uh, a way of customer telling us, if you do that, we'll like you more. Okay, And uh, it's, it's a way of communication. Customers telling us, the residents telling us that uh, they want things to better, and they see things can be improved to make this a better community. And most importantly, this is a way of the board to listen to the residents and make sure we understand their issues. Okay, so uh, there's a way to, if, uh, if we want positive uh, comments, there is a way to do that. If you look at uh, uh, Amazon, they have the way to comment on those things uh, positively. We see five stars. So if we can have some kind of website providing them a channel to provide us the common feedback uh, that would uh, hopefully will make it happen with our new CRMS system or the Granicus system that has e comment area. That will improve a lot of the positive comments. There are ways to do that. So we can definitely uh, learn from the past from the business that we can get better service to our residents. That's the communication, that's listening skill, and that's the negative comments that can turn into a positive uh, uh, effect on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the member comments. I would like them a lot there to hear. So I, I would like them almost right off the bat, but I like them early. Um, I think that's a better use of time. Otherwise, as you say, it's difficult for people to know when to come and so on. I also uh, think perhaps that the traffic problem down there should be considered by security and the traffic committee and they can find out. You can get a stop sign. It's a very difficult process and so on, but we may be able to take other measures that will help that out. So, so it's not just a you do have the right of way wherever you are, even if you are in the wrong and if you are cross, cross jaywalking or whatever. I mean, you still have the right of way as a life person. So, so I'm sure we can, we can work on that. It is, I understand it is an issue. Um, as far as telling GRF what to do, well, I'll speak to Maxine and GRF about that. Um, Let's see. I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. Raisa, you had your hand up next. Me? Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, talk to Maxine about his uh, comment about picket ball. I feel the same. There is a waste of money to put our money on games and picket ball, etc. when we have serious infrastructure problem. And I, uh, I'm, a, I'm in favor of that. The second thing I want to say is that uh, directors here are not cheerleaders to give you happy time and jump and say, yeah, you're doing great, man. They have to give you, uh, they have to give you the negative points as well. When money is being wasted, you don't need to silence people. Thank you. Gary? OK. I have a couple things. Um, I think first, as far as the complaining is concerned, um, I think it's a positive thing when people do come in to complain. And the way I was brought up was uh, don't complain unless you're willing to do something about it. And to me, the people that come in here are willing to do something about it. Next thing are the pedestrians and we live in a senior community of which I am a part. I am not about to step off the curb in front of a, an 80-year-old driver coming down the street. <laughs> so I think we need to use a little discretion when we step off the curb. And, and I even do that at the stop signs. Um, as far as Pat is concerned, um, we're not making decisions at, at these meetings. What we're doing are discussing 
problems and different ways that they can be pursued and taking it back to the board so that the board can make a valid decision. And um, so I disagree with you on that. Um, that's it. Steve? Regarding member comments, um, I haven't heard anyone discuss the number of letters that we get in our mailboxes every month from people who thank us for getting certain things done, other people who call and, or uh, send in notes and letters that have a complaint. So this goes on every day of the year. And the member comments that are presented here um, are a portion of that. And each one of our residents has the ability at any time to communicate their thoughts, whether it be through letters to the editor of the Globe, or contacting the community manager, or writing any of the board members, uh, the board, I should say, directly, and we all get copies of that. So this is not the sole forum for anyone to bring any issue forward. Um, regarding the traffic situation, um, again, it, I'll, I'll just reiterate Gary's remarks. It, it is an older community, and I take nothing for granted at any point in time, giving people's uh, eyesight capability, their hearing capability, the number of people who drive in this community who do not have driver's licenses, which we can really not correct at any issue at all. Uh, you can have a valid driver's license today and it can be taken away from you tomorrow and we wouldn't know about it. So, you know, um, caveat emptor, more or less. And uh, as far as the board officers of the mutuals, um, taking it upon themselves to go ahead and meet as presidents or as treasurers uh, or in any capacity thereof, the secretaries. I have no problem with it whatsoever because it is for conversational and discussion purposes only. It is the um, sharing of common information uh, and difficulties that we all have as mutuals. Prior to my appointment to this board as an advisor to both Third and GRF and United, um, for many years I tried to shuttle information between committees so that everyone was aware of the common problems and the exceptional problems that we had as mutuals. And I think we've come a long way forward in that regard, and especially in looking at um, hiring consultants for community lighting rather than two mutuals and GRF doing it independently. We're kind of doing it as a group with uh, greater thought and focus and, and more efficiently. So um, I, I commend the presidents and, and the treasurers for going forward with this. And uh, if anyone thinks it's a matter of being outside the legal requirements of Davis Sterling, I'm sure we can get an answer from uh, our legal counsel, but I don't believe it is. Thank you. Janie? I have a couple of comments, <coughs> Maxine. I wanted to tell you I have a personal friend that plays pickleball, and I'm a pickleball player. He took a fall because of a uh, crack in the concrete. He fell over backwards. He had blood coming out of his ears. He was in a coma for at least two months, and his personality has changed, and he will never be the same person I knew in the beginning. And I think we do need to take a good look at what we're doing with the pickleball courts. I know it's not a United issue. It is a GRF issue. Um, I wanted to comment, Mike. I want to tell you, I remember my mother coming home from where I was born in Illinois, and she stopped for a pedestrian, and the pedestrian yelled at her because it was not the law there to stop for pedestrians. <laughs> so I think part of our problem here is, and it's not a problem, we have residents from all over with different types of traffic laws. So I also cross sometimes where you cross, but... I do wait. Oh, well, I do too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. And I wanted to comment uh, as far as uh, the president and vice president of this board attending meetings with the other board 
presidents and vice presidents, which I am included. There is no agenda. We share some great ideas, and we do not make decisions. And I agree with exactly what Steve said. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll just finish up with we don't make decisions at these meetings, but we do bring ideas forward, which is why I brought this forward today. We are not saying we need to do this. We should do it. We're splitting it out there and saying, what do you think? And we got some really good feedback today. And that's, that's what we want. Also, uh, Michael, you might want to pick up a, there's a booklet at the front desk with the traffic rules and regulations that all, for the state of California that apply within the village and the ones that are separate or different from the village are, are on the website. I see you've got that already. But anybody can come by the front desk here at the community center and pick up one of those DMV booklets that talks about the traffic rules and regulations uh, for the state of California. Or if you're like me and your license is about to be renewed and you need to study up for the test, <laughs> come and get one. I might also Mac, uh, mention that February 22nd is when the next uh, Security Access Committee meeting will be in this room. And so if you have um, traffic issues, things about that and security, that's really where you, you need to bring them. So there's no decision that we can make as a board on those. All right, let's go on to the consent calendar, which is item number 11. <clears throat> and is there... First of all, I need a motion for the consent calendar. I so move. All right, and I a second. second. I second. All right, now we'll go to discussion. Uh, is there any <clears throat> item on the consent calendar that a director would like to remove for further debate? Man. Uh, I would just like to make a uh, comment on uh, <clears throat> item. Uh, 11D. D. D. Uh, B, B2. Uh, I was at the um, Netscape and meeting where they uh, were going to review all these items. And unfortunately, I had a doctor appointment. I had to leave early. And they never got to this agenda item. But that's a tree that's planted within about two to three feet of the wall of the manor. And it's in a flower bed area. And there's water lines underneath that tree. And, uh, I'm sorry. I'm surprised yeah. that they put it on here not to remove the tree. Because well, the that's because the vote of the committee at, when they did the tour was that. If you would like to remove it for further discussion, then that's what we're looking at now. Yes. All right. So, bring it up. all right. We will remove. I'd like to remove this. Yes. Uh, it's uh, B2. And then uh, item uh, 11D. Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't be in favor of that. It's just that the way it was brought into the agenda. We did not discuss it before the meeting at the agenda prep meeting. And I think it's an item that's important to discuss. I'm not saying I would be against it. I'm just saying that I don't like the method in which it was introduced into the agenda. So that I'd like to have it removed and then reconsidered and then brought back in. All right. Those are the two. <clears throat> Gary? Um, I I'm interested in knowing your concern about this because I may also have one okay, if I'm, you I'm, have. If, I'm going to move that item from 11D okay. to 13C and All we right. will discuss okay. it then. All right. Um, on um, 11B, uh, we will move that to the landscape <clears throat> report, which is 14F. And discuss it then. All right. Uh, I move are there approval any other? of the uh, we amended agenda. Right. Okay. Second to approve the amended agenda. Uh, uh, excuse me. Consent calendar. <laughs> Consent calendar. Sorry. Second. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, all those in favor of the approving the consent calendar as amended. Mm -hmm. Any opposed? All right, it's unanimous. Okay, we will go to 
<coughs> we have uh, we took the two under 12 unfinished business and moved those to 13. So as of now, under new unfinished business, there are none. And we will move to <coughs> new business 13 and look at 13A, which was 12A. And that's <coughs> in your packet, discuss and consider. We move those two items to 13. Yes. Yeah. So, Madam Chair, it's, can we take um, 12B, which is now 13B first, while Ernesto is making his way down? All right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> 13B was to entertain a motion approving a resolution of the committee appointments. Uh, <coughs> Madam Secretary, would you please read that resolution? Was okay. was 13 B. It was, it it was, was originally 12B. <coughs> 13B in, in the agenda. Right. Yeah, it was 12. Resolution 017XXX, United Laguna Woods Mutual Committee Appointments. Resolved January 9th, 2018, that the following persons are hereby appointed to serve the corporation in the following capacities. Architectural Control and Standards Committee, Janie Durrell Chair, Don Tibbetts Co-Chair, Cash Akrakar, Pat English. Non-voting advisors, Michael Maron, Kay Anderson, Walter Ridley. Business Planning, Juanita Skillman Chair, Gary Morrison Co-Chair, Pat English and Andre Torn. Communications Committee, Maggie, Maggie Blackwell Chair, Juanita Skillman Alternate. Executive Members Hearing Committee, Juanita Skillman Chair, Janie Durrell Co-Chair, Cash Akrakar, Steve Leonard. Finance Committee, Gary Morrison Chair, Manuel Amandaris, Pat English, Steve Leonard, Juanita Skillman, Non-Voting Advisor, Alan Dickinson. Governing Documents Review Committee, Juanita Skillman Chair, Maggie Blackwell Co-Chair, Steve Leonard, Gary Morrison, Non-Voting Advisors, Bev Ann Strom, Mary Stone. Laguna Woods Village Traffic Hearings, Cash Akrakar, <coughs> Rotating Chair. Landscape Committee, Maggie Blackwell Chair, Manuel Andaris, Janie Durrell, Non-Voting Advisor, Pamela Grundke, with a D, with a Grundke. I, I, let's see. Maintenance and Construction Committee, Don Tibbetts Chair, Steve Leonard Co-Chair, Reza Bastani, Janie Durrell, Pat English, Gary Morrison, Non-Voting Advisor, Del Ng, Jas Jack Bassler. New Resident Orientation per Rotation List. Resident Advisory Committee, Don Tibbetts Chair, Cash Akrakar Co-Chair, Andre Torn, Non-Voting Advisors, Kay Anderson, Nancy Lannan. Laguna Woods Energy Committee, Steve Leonard. Resolved further, Resolution 01-17-131, adopted November 14, 2017, is hereby superseded and canceled. Resolved further, the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move. Okay, is there a second? Yeah. Done. Any discussion? <clears throat> Andre? Uh, according to the assignment chart, I see most people have uh, five or four assignments, but uh, I have only two assignments. I have some spare hand uh, uh, at this point. Is it possible that I join any of the committees that uh, learn some uh, uh, trades in the committee and uh, contribute? Uh, I'm seeing that the uh, landscape committee has only three people, business uh, and uh, architecture control has four. And the communication committee has two, and the energy committee has only one. Uh, anybody needs help at this point? That's up to the committee chairs. The committee chairs decide who they want on their committee and who okay. they don't want on their committee. And we respect that, and that's why uh, we have the list every time. So 
You can talk to some of the chairs and see if they have, would like to have you on their committee. Uh, that present a problem that if you have a different opinion from the chair, the chair will exclude you from that, their committee. That's their responsibility. That's their So ability. it's only one voice committee. It's not the separate voice committee. If you have a different opinion and you want to bring up the issues, there's no way you can bring up the issues there. And there's uh, no way I can vote against certain decisions. You can't vote, but you can certainly bring up issues because right, there's but member I comments at everyone. That's correct. So is that a fair uh, committee assignment <coughs> at this point? So it is. So we want to continue that practice. Yes. Just let the chair to determine who should be uh, assigned to what. Uh, and if they don't agree with the uh, committee member, they can exclude that committee member to, uh, uh, board member to attend the, his or her meeting. It's the, the committee, committee chair's responsibility to have a cohesive committee that is going to work together. And if there is someone they feel is not contributing and is not working well with the rest of the committee, they can ask that that person be <clears throat> excluded. Thank you very much for being re Pat? Uh, removed from all these committees. I, I would be happy to give up the architectural Committee for um, Andre, if that's agreeable. You to can't trade. It is not agree. It is yeah. not agreeable. Okay. Thank you very Jamie? much. <clears throat> what is the amount of the directors on a on a committee compared to your advisors? Can yeah. you have equal <coughs> amount? That's what you have. Okay. What I would <coughs> like to add then. If you look at my committee, the Architectural Control and Standards Committee, I have not talked with Walter at all, and there's nothing against him at all. But I have talked to Ken Deepy, and he is not on my list. I'd like to add him as an advisor. Okay. His, his name is Ken. His last name is spelled D-E-P-P-E. -E. I, I don't know Walter Ridley. Well, he, he, was, uh, he was at our last committee meeting, and he expressed that he wanted to be on the committee. I've not heard from him. I don't have his information, but I feel that Ken Deepy is very qualified. He's a geologist. And I'll, so I would also, if I can, accept Walter Reedley also on my committee. He has a big, he's a contractor, good construction background. Right. Well, if it's if allowed, yeah. I would like to have both of them on my committee as advisors. There are four members on that committee. You can have four member advisors. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, Corporate Secretary, would you add Ken DP to that committee as a non-voting advisor? Yes, Raisa. Uh, we are gonna. We're not gonna be drilling oil wells here uh, to have geologists uh, <laughs> involved in it. You need more as a, a piping engineer, or electrical engineer. <coughs> so uh, you need to reconsider your uh, thinking, Madam Chair. I call the question. All right. <coughs> The question has been called. It takes a two-thirds vote to call the question. All those who are ready to vote, please raise your hand. What are we voting uh, for? Well, we are voting for. The, we are voting to, well, voting to vote. We are voting to call the question. According to Robert's rules, in order to call a question, you need two-thirds. That cuts off debate and mm -hmm. calls the question. So all those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Three. Okay. All right, then we are ready to vote. Am I allowed to say something? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, yes, you are. Time. Yes. <clears throat> I'm living here a long time, and I've watched changes in this community, and we don't always agree with each other. We don't always like each other, but we have to put up with each other because we live in a large community. And that's also true when we sit on committees. And I have watched people who are really interested sitting on committees, and I have watched it change to people who think one way. I have no opinion about anything right now other than the fact that I have said this at GRF meetings also. Committees somehow get stacked so that if there's someone who heads the committee or might just be a member of the committee as a, a board member, what they want to accomplish for that year, they put people on who they know, will vote their way. 
And I think that this is a new year. I think it's really time for us to take into consideration when we vote for you people, we don't know exactly how you're going to vote on everything. And that's true of who gets elected to boards, who you choose for boards, and who you choose for committees. And I think that it's time, and I don't necessarily mean this particular vote, but I think it's time that we out there on the other side of the TV have a feeling that everybody who sits on these boards and who gets invited to or volunteers to committee meetings can have their thoughts heard and an ability to vote if they're board members. I think we should start that new year off right. And I really greatly hope that you will take into consideration what I've said and go over the last three or four years. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other <clears throat> discussion on this? We have another request to speak. Mary Stone. Mary Stone, 356C. Um, it is the job of the committees to advise the members of the board who have the final say in whatever the issue uh, comes before the board. The people who want to attend committee meetings, anybody can attend the committee meetings if they are a member of the corporation, of the mutual. So anybody who wants to comment on subjects that are being discussed in a committee meeting can attend those committee meetings. So the fact that they don't have a vote, the, the final vote is, is at, the, at the board meeting, not at the, not at the committee meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Andre. It's not even called. Oh, the oh. question has been called. Oh. We've cut off right. debate. We had discussion from the audience, but we now have debate. So it's time to vote. <laughs> Uh, would you please vote on 13A, which, I mean, 13B, which is a resolution of the committee assignment? It's 13B. 12B now. Well, it's Isn't 13B. It, it no, was 13. 12. No, it's 13. I don't know. All right. All those in favor, <clears throat> please raise your hand. All those opposed? Two against. Okay. All right, uh, uh, 13B passes, and now we'll go back to 13A, which was to consider the handyman services program, and I see that Ernesto is here. Ernesto, would you like to set this up for us, please? <clears throat> Absolutely, thank you, uh, Madam President, uh, board members. Uh, the, we've been uh, working on putting together this handyman program for the community. Uh, model after the program that is currently in place at Walnut Creek. I think most of you are familiar. We've uh, conducted a, uh, a conference call with the Walnut Creek uh, staff and uh, uh, various board uh, members uh, to kind of get a feeling for uh, how their program works, how successful it has been, what uh, they provide as a service to the community the cost of the program, and a number of other things. We've uh, taken the services that they provide over there, and we kind of pared them down to what we feel those services will be of use to the community here for us. Uh, we've uh, met with uh, third at the MNC level, and they approved us to move forward with the program subject to the additional discussions which shall, I believe will be taking place on the 30th at the, at the corporate member meeting. Uh, we will, uh, again, at that meeting, make a short presentation on the program and make any tweaks to the programs that, that the boards may feel that are needed uh, before moving forward. Uh, we went to the MNC uh, for United and it, the program was uh, uh, presented and it was welcomed by the committee and we were asked to bring it forward to the full board to get an endorsement to move forward. Uh, there is no financial commitment at this point from uh, United uh, Board. Uh, the only financial commitment at this point will be from GRF. Uh, we are asking GRF and we'll be going to uh, the GRF board in February to request that. Uh, but we're asking for a $50,000 appropriation to be able to purchase a vehicle and the equipment that's needed to provide the service. 
Uh, there's a list of things that, uh, and by the way, this is, has been an article in the breeze about this. There's, uh, we provided uh, the list of services are in, the, in your website that you can download them. But uh, the $50,000 appropriation from PRF will allow us to get the program rolling. We do have staff that has been uh, allocated already in the 2018 budget. So that's ready to go. So all the pieces are falling into place. Uh, at this point, we need a, your authorization to move forward. Uh, after February, when we get the appropriation in place from GRF, we'll be ready to go. There's some logistics that need to be worked out uh, with our resident services, with the calls coming in and all of that. Uh, and as soon as we get that done, I would uh, anticipate that in around March, uh, middle of March, we should be able to roll this out and begin to offer it to, uh, to the entire village. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have on any of it. Okay. Steve? Um, I'd just like to say that this has been an ongoing uh, item uh, from, and discussion for a, a fairly moderate period of time. I'm in support of the program. Um, I believe that um, Ernesto had included in his budget for 2018 additional people to be able to handle this uh, initial pilot for the mutuals for the last for this, this that year. That is correct. So we're already budgeted, and uh, as he said, only GRF will have to make a commitment of about $50,000 for. Um, the, the vehicles and tools. Um, I would like to state, because we will be taking this under the corporate members meeting, which is not open to our residents, that um, my only concern with the program is um, the cost to enroll and the number of service calls that will be provided. So I will take that up in the uh, corporate members meeting, and I'm going to request that uh, they look to increase the amount of funds required to participate and decrease the number of service calls because I think that uh, three service calls per month not to exceed two <coughs> hours is going to be untenable. But so those are my remarks. Thank you. Any other remarks, Pat? Uh, yeah. First of all, um, I don't think we're going to be able to take that up at the corporate members meeting. It's only a one-topic yeah. issue. I'm sorry, yes. that's not true. We'll be able we to. went through that with the attorneys, and the attorney says there is no prohibition about having only one topic. That's just a general rule that we, not even rule, general thing that we have done. But there is not a uh, prohibition against having more than one. I believe But that's it not probably uh, will not be at the. Uh, mm -hmm. January 30th meeting because they're still looking at it. It will be a corporate members meeting that will be called later. Okay, and I would like to ask UNESCO, how many times per month now are you going to allow the members to call on, for, on this? It's and report. could a new it's service be added if uh, you found it was necessary? For example, yeah. cleaning blinds or something sure. like that? Sure. Uh, currently, we are anticipating three, three service calls uh, allowed per month mm -hmm. with about a two-hour span with each of the calls. Uh, if you were to call uh, for service and, and the VMS staff was not able to complete it within the two hours, you can use another uh, call to come back and complete that service. There's a number of things that are being provided through this service, uh, which include changing light bulbs, uh, fixing uh, switches, uh, small electrical things, clearing a drain, uh, fixing a tub, uh, faucets, um, window decks, chase, things like that. And there's a, a number of also personal services that will be offered, including the installation of vacuum cleaner bags, removal and installation of table leaves, uh, turning mattresses, just a number of things that are currently not uh, covered under uh, the mutuals uh, co-op agreement. Thank so uh, I think it'll be, it'll be very helpful to uh, many of our uh, particularly elderly uh, residents. Thank you, Ernesto. Okay, no. hey, Cash, you're next, and then Manny. <clears throat> Ernesto, I have a quick question for you. A lot of people have purchased upgraded units 
me included. And of particular interest I want to bring is number 360. A poor person ended up paying a lot of money and got substandard work. Is there any provision? Now, these people cannot, like I cannot ask for any service because these items now are excluded. Not but from is, the handyman. Sure. Pardon me? Yeah. Not from the handyman. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. I, and I, what, yeah. what are we doing the, for these people? Right, right. Under uh, the, the mutual bylaws, uh, if it's an alteration, uh, the service may be provided by VMS staff as a chargeable service. However, on their, the handyman service, those, uh, those services may be provided uh, with the uh, $200 annual fee. So that's where it would be handy for uh, many of those folks that have upgraded their, their washers or their counters or things uh, that the mutual would not pay for to do any upgrades or, or fixes to. Uh, they, with the handyman service, it's an opportunity for them to do that, covered on an annual basis with a $200 fee to, to do any of that. So that's one of the benefits of the program. Manu Thank you. Manuel? Um, yes. Uh, has an analysis of some kind been done on this program so that we know uh, how many employees we're going to use for this, how much the cost of vehicle is going to be, and when eventually it might be on a on a pay-as-you-go basis where the residents aren't supporting this, it's all being, you're carrying itself through some program? Absolutely. Uh, Can you tell us about that? Sure, uh, Madam President. I, uh, we did conduct an analysis of what it would take to have the service self-sustained from a financial uh, uh, standpoint. Uh, it would take uh, approximately 500 residents to actually join the service to uh, make it uh, worthwhile and break even uh, from a financial stand. We did uh, determine that we will launch the service with two of uh, UMass staff members at this point. Uh, we also uh, calculated that one vehicle with the appropriate uh, tools uh, would be adequate to, han to handle the needs. Uh, the program may grow in uh, the experience in, uh, in um, in the Walnut Creek was that they started it with only uh, one person and actually the program has grown significantly. So there is a, 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 a big value to them at this point. So we did conduct all that analysis, did the calculations, figured out what the cost would be, uh, and that's how we determined that a minimum of 500 members joining the program will be able to offset it. <clears throat> Maggie. Um. I studied the Walnut Creek uh, two years ago, and I found it a very interesting and effective program that I thought we might be able to use. And I would really like us to try it. So I move that we, cons that, that we endorse the Handyman Services Program. I'll second it. Okay. <clears throat> Respect to discussion, uh, Janie, you had a... I just had a question. If one of our residents is part of this program and they have three items at one time to have done, is that counted as one service call or three? If they could be accommodated within the two hour limit for the service call, one. it would be counted as one. Thank one you. Service call. Yeah. All right, Andre. Uh, looking at uh, the attachment one uh, description of services, if we go through the list, uh, number four, other electricals, you place defective light switches and outlets. Uh, I have a unit that comes with this original unit, doesn't have any uh, upgrade on that, it's just some on floor and the paint, that kind of thing, and, uh, and the countertop, and you know, pretty much the basic model. And I like it that way because I want to take advantage of mutual services. A lot of people purchase those units for that reason. Uh, but there is no upgrade. So other electrical, drains, plumbing, toilet, sinks, kitchen and baths, tub and shower, faucet, dishwasher, vent, fans, water heaters, uh, sliding glass door <coughs> and windows, sliding screens and drawers. These are all included in the basic services. And if you count it, there's 24, uh, total 24 services, and there are 13 or 14 of them are already covered uh, under the basic uh, uh, mutual services. Yes. So 
is it fair to, uh, for those uh, units to pay the full price rather than give them some kind of discount so they are not uh, uh, being penalized because they are everything is a standard uh, uh, equipment? Just my question. Yeah, if I may, uh, that's a decision that the resident needs to make to see if there is value to the resident as to the personal services that are also offered. The mutual will not cover for a VMS staff to come over and turn your mattress. It you will not cover for a staff uh, to come over and uh, hang your shades. Uh, so that's a value to the resident. If the resident feels that that constitutes a $200 value per year and that they can make the number of calls to be able to cover that, then that's a decision that the resident will have to make. Yeah. But you're absolutely correct. A lot of those items <coughs> under original condition are, mu are okay. covered by the union. <coughs> Maggie? Uh, yes, that's why it's a voluntary program. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have all the United stuff, you don't need the program necessarily unless you want them out for special things. Uh, this is for people who are partly alterations and partly not, and for people who need assistance, flipping beds and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's for those of us who are a little bit in limbo land right now who would appreciate this program. But certainly if your whole place is just almost entirely still united, you, you should have no problem there. You just can't avail yourself of any of the extras. Thank you. Janie? Is there going to be a difference between the services for United compared to third? Because we have property services that helps us, as Andre commented. No, it will be uh, $200 throughout for both mutuals. Uh, so similar situation occurs in third where their appliances are not serviced by VMS. They're uh, supplied by the resident and they're a chargeable service to them. Uh, they may choose where uh, the value comes in for third is that in lieu of going out and getting a vendor that they're not familiar with, uh, and they can avail themselves of VMS staff who's already familiar with <coughs> their manner, their layout, <coughs> their electrical systems, and all of that. So it's a much cheaper cost for them to have a VMS staff to come in and address something that's small rather than call an outside vendor. So there is a value to both mutuals, uh, and uh, there's no difference in the cost. All right, I'm going to call for a vote now. I um, want to emphasize that what we are doing is saying that we want uh, VMS to go forward in developing this pilot program. We are not uh, okaying any specific program at this time because they still have work to do on it. But what we are doing is endorsing the pilot program. And I emphasize again that it is voluntary. Nobody needs to subscribe to this if they don't want to. We will go very hard to, or try very hard to make sure they understand what's covered and what's not covered and the differences. And then it's, it's completely voluntary. Points of information? If it's a pilot, when does it get reevaluated and a chance for you to repost? That will all be in the program that is presented to us after their uh, evaluation in February. Yeah. It's, we are not voting on the program the today. We are voting on the them going so. ahead to develop the program, the idea. We think it's worthwhile for our members. Members have questions. Yeah, okay, I have another. I'd, I'd like to modify the uh, resolution you just put forward. I, I would like to change it to that we would be endorsing the program. That's, yeah, that's what it that's is. That's what I said. We're endorsing the. Right. The program. I uh, are we ready to vote? Uh, uh, Madam President, exactly we have what request to speak. On. Yeah, what are we voting on? Are we voting on a pilot or are no. we on a program development? No. Oh, let's listen to, we have another member that wants to speak. Who is it? Cheryl? Maxine McIntosh. Oh, I have yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I hope everyone listening at home, and this will probably be in the paper, understands that this is a gift. This is a gift from your board, from United to the public. When you figure out 
that by paying just $200 a year, not one penny more this year, the pilot program, you can have up to 72 hours of this handyman help. My neighbor next door pays $40 an hour for her handyman. The lowest price I know of is a woman who hires a friend living in the village for 25. Figure it out. This is a bargain. And when you look at the two pages of lists on page four of nine and five of nine, look at those long lists. And it says other ideas could be included. And I think of that neighbor of mine before she passed away, she just couldn't reach the cupboards in her bedroom. And she called on someone at her church to come and pull everything out for her so she could put it in lower drawers where she could reach it. She didn't want to get on a stepladder anymore. She was in her 80s and didn't want to do that. And while they were there, they turned her mattress and made her bed. That's what you can do here. So this is good for everybody. It's a real bargain, and I consider it a real gift to include mm -hmm. United in this pilot program. Our next, our next request to speak is from Roberta Burke. Quite frankly, I, I'm not quite sure where I want to start. However, I think the intention is wonderful, and I think there probably are people who may need this. However, this community is over 50 years old. What has everybody done for all these years? They have made phone calls to neighbors, and they've found out that there are <coughs> people living right here in our community who need a little extra money and can do all of these things. This board has had discussions in previous years about handicapped and disabled and not wanting and, and caregivers and all kinds of problems. And my personal feeling is that this is not an issue we need to get involved in. And I don't think it's an issue the GRF needs to get involved in. I see this as a tremendous liability, number one. I see this, when we change to VMSI instead of PCM, one of the issues and one of the reasons that I fought for it was because the staff was so large and PCM was at that time making so much money on staff. And here we are, all I see is more staff and more staff and more staff. This is not going to, in a community like Walnut Creek, which is small, which is all high rise, where a guy can go from one unit to another and another and another, yes, one might be, might be sufficient. In a community like this, there is no way one car and one man will be able to handle everything. We heard a whole thing. We moved the gym downstairs to make room for more people in property services because we were getting so many phone calls. Do you realize how many more telephone calls? we're going to be, get, be getting for, for all these little cockamamie <clears throat> things that a next door neighbor can do if you pay him a couple of bucks. I think that we are getting involved in something that is not our business. It's a personal matter for families to find out and take care of these kind of things. And hey, I'm up there already. I'm not one of the younger ones in this <clears throat> community. And it certainly is going to be a service that I could probably use. I don't think from the standpoint of looking for the benefit of this community, that this is the kind of thing that we need to get involved in. This is more staff, and it's never, ever going to cover itself in the long run. You want to do something for all of us? Let's get going with the lighting program that we've been asking for for the 20 years and before that I've been here. Thank you. Are there any other discussion from the bar? All right. <clears throat> Again, what we are voting on is to endorse the handyman service pilot project and, and allow Ernesto and, Un and, Un and uh, maintenance to go forward in developing this project, which they will bring back to us for a final vote with all of the criteria. So all of those in favor? Please oh, raise your hand. Well, I, I'm not sure about the, the, the uh, <coughs> details of this uh, endorsement. So may I ask a question? Uh, are we uh, talking about? We, we have all spoken. <coughs> what we are I, voting on, is, if that is your question, is to endorse going forward. We think the handyman program is a good program. We don't have the details. We are not uh, <coughs> adopting that program. We are just telling. Uh, maintenance that we think it's a good idea and to go forward and develop the program. 
Are we doing the program on the paper and the procedures? Are we, are we going to actually implement some of the pilot to identify? We don't have issues? those yet. That's what we will vote okay, on. Okay, so we are only going to work on the paper procedures. That we are, we are just the asking them to go ahead and develop the program. <coughs> okay. I'm sorry. Pilot, okay. All right, all program, those in, in favor, please raise your hand. Are there any opposed? No, it is unanimous and passed. Thank you. All right, uh, 13C. Um, is uh, the item that was pulled from the consent agenda, which was 11B. Uh, and that was the tree removal at 396A. <coughs> and I will, uh, let's see, would you read that? That was under 11. 14. 11B, B. which one? Number two. 2B. <coughs> 11B, page one of five, page two of five. Uh, the Magnolia, is that the one? Let me look. Yeah, it's I don't the see. one at 396A. Which number are we in? I can't tell. Uh, it's on page uh, two of five, eleven. It's, it's the second resolution. Right. Okay. 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 Um, trees. This is the tree uh, removal guidelines, the four dots. Unless there's a purposeful reason trees should not be removed merely because they are messy or because of residents' personal preferences concerning shape, color, size, or fragrance. Trees should not be removed because of view obstruction. Trees on slopes should not be removed if the removal will contribute to the destabilization of that slope. Trees which are damaging or which will damage a structure pose a hazard in failing health or interfering with neighboring trees will be considered for removal. Uh, we inspected this tree, I see there, at 396A, and we found that Sorry, it's in the landscape report. Let me find it. Here we go. The committee unanimously recommended denial of the request to remove the tree. At the time of inspection, there was no damage to the walkway, no damage to patio wall or foundation of the manor. Staff will trim as needed during normal trim cycle. So finding no damage, we denied the request to remove the tree. So you want to go back to the resolution? Uh, <coughs> I move the resolution. Okay, so I have a second. A comment on that? Wait, just, just a moment. <coughs> you second. Janie seconded it. All right, now we're up for discussion. Manny? Yeah, uh, like I said, unfortunately, I had to leave before this item was considered by the committee, and I was surprised with the result. I have a picture here from that meeting. Uh, it's actually the tree is planted in a, what I consider a flower bed area within two to three feet of the wall there. There's a record that those sprinkler lines, and there's right here, big sprinkler lines that go to provide water for that landscape area. Then a circle here where there's two hose bibs right up against that wall right there, and I am sure the water lines, the tree roots were right over that. So even if you had a pruder removing them, it's going to be a major problem. That, that Someday you're going to have a water problem with the water lines right there. That tree never should have been planted there at the end of it. So I am saying this should be no <coughs> damaging or will damage a structure or will damage a water line. I'd like to pass this picture around so they can see what I've circled. Two whole water lines right there going into the unit. Just pass it around. I'd like to comment on that. Uh, Bob Murgett, tree manager, was there. Uh, Raul was there. He's irrigation. And um, Mike Swinghome was there also. Uh, 
and they all agreed that there would be no damage from this tree. Uh, it is clearly a 40 or 50 year old tree. So far there is nothing. It is a small place, but the tree, the walkway is not disturbed, you see. So on the potential, when, when there is damage, Raul will be called to, to make a report. And if he says it is interfering with the tree, I mean with the, with the water lines, of course the tree will be removed. At this time, it's not. But at this time, there is no problem. There have been no calls about that irrigation line. So it isn't like we never look at the tree again. When someone reports a problem, the list will be taken and, and the move will be made. But at this time, we have no recorded problem. The property owner did report that our systems had to be fixed again several times. What did you do for the tree? Because there were cracks in it. Madam President, I'd like Steve? to call the question. All right. Rather than call the question, are we ready to vote? <laughs> it's not the same thing. <laughs> All we need is a majority if we are ready to vote. Uh, we have a motion and a second to deny the tree removal at 396A. All of those in favor of accepting the committee's report and denying 396A tree removal, please raise your hand. Six, all those against? All right. <clears throat> Six three one one abstain, so it is passed. No, I'm up, I, I abstain. It's six three one. All right, uh, let's go on to uh, fourteen on your agenda, and <clears throat> these are the committee reports. Again, uh, to our audience, this is, oh, excuse me, Pat. Madam Chair, how about we were going to do um, 11D also, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 11 I think that would come before the Oh, I'm committee sorry, reports. okay. All right. Uh, D, that was 13C, okay, I'm sorry. I, 13, no D then. From 11D. Okay. <clears throat> Maggie, can you find? Um, uh, I'll try 11D. It will be as 11D. I see it? Yeah. Well, we don't really have a resolution. resolution. Yes, we do. There we go. Okay, attachment one. Resolution 0118XX, appointment of officers. Resolved on January 9, 2018, pursuant to the United <coughs> Laguna Woods Bylaws, Article 9, officers, which sets guidelines, terms, and responsibilities for the election of officers to this corporation. The following persons are hereby elected to the office indicated next to their names to serve. Juanita Skillman, President, Janie Del Durrell, First Vice, Don Tibbetts, Second Vice, Maggie Blackwell, Secretary, Gary Morrison, Treasurer. Resolve further that the following staff persons are here appointed as ex officio officers of this corporation. Bradley Hudson, Vice President, ex officio. Betty Parker, Assistant Treasurer, ex officio. Reserve false further that Resolution 01-17-135, adopted October 10, 2017, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are directed on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move this resolution. Is there a second? Steve? Okay, discussion? <clears throat> Pat? Uh, yes, I have no objection to the resolution itself. However, I, I do agree that this was not considered at the uh, agenda meeting or any other meeting that we have had. So I'm not sure how one should vote on it based on that 
issue alone. All right, uh, Laura, you want to answer that? So if you remember last year, um, both Brad and I were your ex officios. So we were around, one of us was always around to sign if need be. With me leaving and the new person coming on, not quite acclimated, because we haven't even hired anybody yet, um, it seemed most logical to, have, to bring Betty on as ex officio. And so I think that's my bad. I thought that because it was kind of standard for us, we put it on consent. So my apologies. That's why it was on consent. Strictly housekeeping. <clears throat> Manny? Like I said before, as I said before, I may not necessarily be opposed to this. It's just the way it was added to the agenda. And then I have a number of questions on it. For example, um, when I look at this list of why you want to add this person, I'm not sure which documents she wouldn't have been signing anyway. I don't want to authorize somebody to be an officer to sign documents that basically might just be a rubber stamp. When I give somebody the authority to be an, an official that can sign documents, I want that person to be responsible for looking at whatever supporting documentation needs to be looked at to add a signature authorizing that transaction or that document. So I'd like to have more discussion about these. I'd, I'd like to know why it would be necessary to have uh, Betty signed documents that you normally would have the president sign. You know, uh, she what would kind not. of circumstance would These you have? These are ex officio so officers, like and they on that do before not you sign. It for approval. Okay, uh, Gary and then Maggie. Yeah, I understand what uh, Manuel is is saying, and I think I had the same concern. However, as I started thinking through it, I thought it has no one has abused it thus far, and if it is abused, it can be pulled. So I guess. I'm not that concerned about it. Maggie? Would you feel more comfortable if we put the word interim assistant treasurer ex officio? Interim means only while, while the new person is not ready. Not yeah. I'd like to amend my motion to add the word interim assistant treasurer ex officio. Do I have a second to change that? Uh, let's, right, let's hear from Betty real quick. <clears throat> okay, many of these documents, um, I conduct your administrative processes from a financial perspective as managing agent. Many of these documents I already process um, and do that as your agent. There are a f just a few government documents that require an officer's signature, right? The filing of the tax return, um, and you know a, any of those state to kind of filings, and at that case we we chase down Brad and get a signature, um, because big corporations or the government it's too hard to change the officers so frequently um, as you have with your board members changing and your officer positions changing. Um, it, it's too difficult to have these different organizations. Um, be changing a, the, who the treasurer is and having only that treasurer sign these documents. So this committee is often and for a long time used um, your staff. You, you operate with an agency relationship and we carry out the business that you direct us to carry out. We're not off doing things on our own. It's carrying out the board's directive. So this is just to make it a little easier on some of the state filings um, to go back to having an assistant treasurer like you've done. It doesn't take anything away from what Gary does or from what the president does. Um, and it, it just keeps me from having to chase down Brad to get signatures on those types of documents. But many of these other items we're already doing as agent. And we're preparing the documents as agent. So um, my hesitation on interim is because the community manager um, won't be filling this role. That was just the last item listed here. Other documents. Um, delegated to the CEO as assistant vice president. Um, that was what Lori was bringing up. But that doesn't apply to the financial stuff. So that's what concerned me about the word interim. OK, I withdraw my, my proposal. Your motion, OK. So we're back <clears throat> to the original one. Andre? I have some concern about uh, under the discussion, the documents to be executed by an ex officio assistant treasurer include 
These are the VMS staff job descriptions. We don't do that. This is a board. We don't take care of these tax returns. These are the VMS staff job. So bring those jobs as a qualification for this ex officio is, you know, we got the purpose wrong. The only thing that matters is the other document dedicated, any document dedicated to the CEO as assistant vice president in his absence. That's the primary responsibility. Only person that is, matters is the uh, CEO as an ex official. The, uh, the general manager can assign anyone else in his absence uh, to represent him. Yeah. So all these jobs this, uh, are just uh, staff descriptions. I don't know why it uh, suddenly becomes a uh, uh, board uh, responsibility now. That's just my comment on this uh, uh, responsibility of this, the role of this uh, person. And it's so, to make it an ex-official assistant treasurer, uh, we, we don't have treasurer position. Tre the treasurer position, is, we have a treasurer position already. So there's no need to assign that. We cannot bring the landscape assistant, landscape uh, ex-official, ex-official uh, of uh, MSC com uh, committees, so there's no need to bring all these. The only one that matters is the general manager. Thank you very much. Manuel. Uh, Andre, I'd just like to uh, address your remarks, and that's that this is only intended to give Betty the authority to sign as an officer. And the key word here really is I have no problem with this as long as she's given that authority only in the absence of the CEO who sh she signed these documents for. And so she's only acting in this capacity. Betty's remarks really help to clarify this. She's only doing this where an officer needs to sign these documents, okay? And so all I want to do is, now that we've discussed it, whatever resolution we pass, I'd like to have it conditioned on that she would have this authority to sign these documents only in the absence of the CEO. So Betty, you. can you dictate a warehouse for us real quick? Well, that's what we tried to do on the, the last item. It says, other documents delegated to the CEO as assistant vice president in his absence. So you could just use that last item. But the, the tax returns and the state filings, it would make sense for your CFO to, fi to file those, mm -hmm. um, to sign those, because we're working with the tax preparer, and, we, and I did for years, right? So it's only during the management transition that that position was removed um, and we've had the CEO signing them. So if you only want the CEO signing your financial documents, we can go that direction. But um, that last line was the one, it was in his absence for anything other than the financial documents. Okay, so we'll add that as a whereas. Well, I just, I just want to introduce at the very top that the documents be executed by this official assistant treasurer would only be done in the absence of the CEO and would include and go on in this program. And you're okay with that, Betty? It's the bottom. I like it the bottom. Well, I, I disagree with that because it's uh, not in uh, every document in the absence of the CEO. There are documents that our CFO signs and our CEO does not. And everything go to Brad, and if he is not there or over there, then they go back to Betty. Doesn't make sense to me. Gary? I would just like to say I, I think we need Betty to be able to sign because she's the one that prepares them. She knows what's there. The CEO, although he, it's his, he's the end uh, as far as the chain goes, however, I don't imagine that he understands every little line item that's in that return, and therefore I think the responsibility should be with the treasurer. All right, uh, <coughs> Andre. Uh, still, I think these are, oh. this is a VMS management responsibility. They, that, the general manager is the one we hire. He decides who does what. There are certain documents that the general manager needs to sign, but he can delegate to anybody else. No. There's no need for us to uh, micromanage and say, you do this one, you do that one. Okay, that's not our job. Well, our job is to delegate it to the uh, general manager, and general manager decides who should do what. So I think the tax from tax return, 
up to vendor credit applications should be removed, and the only one is all documents de delegated to the CEO as assistant vice president in his absence. That's the only sentence that we need to in, no. uh, in this. No, no, no. Uh, uh, in this uh, uh, Laurie. So how about if we, if we add two whereases? One whereas would no. say um, the documents to be executed, executed by an ex officio assistant treasurer include, and then list all of these in the resolution, and then say any other documents should be delegated to the CEO unless he's absent, and then they can go to the treasurer. Just like what the staff report says, but add that to the resolution. All right, Steve. I'm objecting to any modification of this whatsoever. Um, under corporate state law, officers of the corporation are required to sign documents. If those officers are not available, then you use ex officio officers, and the general manager cannot appoint an ex officio officer on his own without the approval of this board. So if you don't understand corporate law and state assignments of responsibilities, you can look into it. I, we have a, a motion on this resolution. <coughs> we have Unless a motion someone a else wants to make a motion to amend, I call the question. So take the vote to call the question. Uh, uh. Madam President, we have a request to be, speak before you vote. All right. Mary Stone. Mary Stone, 356C. I've been a treasurer on this board and other boards, and uh, I have the utmost confidence in our finance director, and I, I'm sure that you can trust them, that they're not going to be signing documents they shouldn't. And so I believe that this, this has been going on for all the years that I've been around here, which is more than 20. And uh, I really feel that uh, it's important that you do, you know, trust your staff enough to do their job without questioning whether they're doing it, you know, appropriately. All right, I'd like to call for the vote. <clears throat> All those in favor of the motion to approve a resolution appointing the assistant treasurer ex officio, please raise your hand. Seven. All those opposed? Three. Motion passes. <clears throat> All right, now we'll go to committee reports. Uh, hold, hold on. Don is not here. How do we get an eight vote? Yes, vote. Seven. It's okay. Seven. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just for our residents, we feel it's important that you know what goes on behind the scenes. You can watch this meeting every month, but you don't know what happens uh, at the committees, what they're working on, what they've done. You see maybe what they bring forward after they have done it. So we feel it's very important that our committees report on what they're looking at, what they're working on, uh, so that we can get input from you or you can go to those committee meetings and express what you uh, feel about those things. So we'll start with the Finance Committee and the Financial Report. Director Morrison. We have the slides, please. <laughs> Slide one. Okay, the total revenue for United through November the 30th, 2017 was 35,990,000 000, compared to expenses of 33,524,000, resulting in a net revenue of 2,466,000. Slide two, please. Through November, United Mutual was better than budget by 3,310,000, primarily due to the late start and fewer expenditures of reserve programs. Wasteline replacements program work started in late May. Building structures uh, had fewer replacements than budgeted. Water lines programs were replaced or placed on hold by the board. And countertops had fewer replacements than budgeted. 
The favorable variance in these programs was partially offset by an unfavorable variance in compensation and related expenses. So resolution 01-17-25 approved unbudgeted <coughs> expenses of 375,000 in landscape department to complete tree trimming cycle in 2017. All the scheduled tree work was completed by July. So minimal off schedule tree work was performed the remainder of the year. Unbudgeted temporary help and overtime resulted from extended hours and resident services, mainly the call center. Slide three, please. On this pie chart, we show the non-assessment revenues received a date of 1,119,000 by category, starting with our largest revenue generating category of interest income, followed by laundry revenue and chargeable services. Slide four, please. On this pie chart, we see expenses to date over 33 and a half million, showing that our largest categories of expense are for compensation and property taxes, followed by utilities and outside services. Slide five, please. The reserve balances on November 30th, 2017 were 23.3 million. The year-to-date contributions and interest to reserves were 11,237,000. Year-to-date expenditures were 8,353,000. Um, the monthly resale report uh, December resales were 49 as compared to 34 last year. Sales volume was 12,579,440 as compared to 8,099,300 last year. Year to date number of resales, we had 481 as compared to 518 in the previous year, we were lower. However, sales volume was 122,554,058 this year as compared to 118,735,724. The average resale price was 254,478 as compared to 229,561 for a year to date change of a 10.9% increase. The delinquencies as of 12 31 2017, the current month total, we had 25 delinquencies for $72,039. Our previous month, we had 23 delinquencies for $76,000, so we had a decrease from the previous month of $4,484. So that's my report. Thank you. <coughs> What's the last page? Thank you. Hmm? Yes, Andre, I'm calling on you. Thank you. I have a question uh, to the tre to the treasurer. Yes. Okay, I have a question on the page three of twelve. So we have twenty eight percent. Our biggest known assessment income is from interest income. Is that right? I'm reading the page three of twelve. Okay. Now, does that include BlackRock investment income? Yes. So we do have uh, income uh, information about those BlackRock. Because every time I'm asking, you know, for each investment, how much money do we make? How much the money do we uh, lose on each one of the BlackRock uh, investment? I was told there is no information on that. So there is. Yes, of course there, there is. is. How come we never see that kind of uh, uh, interest income information on the uh, on the uh, financial statement? Why? Why? What would you do with it if you saw it? You have information. I here. don't do anything with it. Right. Right. I understand you don't do anything. <coughs> but for my own investment, I always watch those money. You know, where do they go, and where do they go higher and lower, and what kind of a decision we need to make. At this point, we give it to them, and we don't just don't know. It just sit there all the time. BlackRock so makes the presentation twice a year. Right. right. And Understand they show that. all of our investments. 
Right. We don't do it on a monthly basis. Correct. <laughs> we May I speak? <laughs> The question I have is, how come we don't have interest income or the total value of the BlackRock investment anywhere to share with us? This uh, here, 28% interest income, clearly indicate that we have that kind of information, but we are not sharing that information with everybody else. That was my question. Thank you. We'll take it under direction. <clears throat> okay. Right, Maggie? What, what, what is uh, the direction? You, Sorry. We, Pardon me? What is the direction? Wait, wait, wait. This is not a dialogue. I said I would take it under direction, which means I will look into that. Under okay. submission. Good. Yeah. Okay. No okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, I would like to point out that we're going to have some different numbers coming up this year because as uh, uh, it showed on slide two, uh, there were work that wasn't started until late May. There was work that was put on all these other things. We made a concerted effort, or uh, maintenance and construction did a concerted effort to get all of our contracts this year starting in January so that we will have a full year. We do the budget September, August and September. And so we don't all, we have to have the contracts ready when the new budget goes in and not wait three or four months while we're negotiating contracts to be able to start the project to use the money in the budget that we did six months earlier. So I think we'll see some different numbers coming up this next year. I'd also like to make a comment on the resale report. <clears throat> The fact that there's a decrease in the number of resales does not mean that we are doing badly. It means there's so, not much inventory. You talk to any of the real estate companies, they're begging for inventory. They sell everything that, are, that they get in two or three days, and uh, there's just not more, and that's why that number is lower. Uh, and <clears throat> certainly the resale price and the fact that it's up 10%, 11% shows that because it is a seller's market, uh, not a buyer's market, but a seller's market, uh, we're, we're really doing quite well. Okay, uh, the next report is the Architectural Control and Standards Committee, Director Durrell. Oh, wait, we didn't mention that the next Finance Committee meeting is January 30th at 2 p.m. in the Sycamore Room. Thank you, President Juanita. I just have a couple little comments of information for everyone uh, of our members. So if you're thinking about an alteration, California law requires a handyman or a contractor to have a license for any job over $500. Begin with your alteration planning with a visit or a call to the Manor Alterations Division window and the resident services at the community center. Staff will outline the procedures and the forms that you will be needed. You can also obtain a copy of the previous alterations to your manor at this window. Do your homework so if you don't get caught with an illegal alteration. If an alteration does not fall under the category of the United's approved standards plan, a variance is required. An, uh, an applicant must submit a request for a variance in writing to the Manor Alterations Division, and then submit must go through thoroughly with a, de a description of the proposed alteration. Include pictures and detailed plans to illustrate the, al the alteration that you're uh, thinking about having done. The request must be submitted 30 days before the next scheduled architecture control and standard committee meeting and conform with the California building codes. Once the staff receives all necessary documentation, a report is prepared and sent to the Architectural Control and Standard Committee. The committee reviews the request and forwards the recommendations to the board for final decision. With any request for an alteration or a variance, all cost and maintenance of the alteration present and in the future are the responsibility of the member. 
Each month, compliance tickets 30 to 40 unauthorized alterations, 10 or more alterations which are not being properly maintained. Be sure to go to Manor Operations window at the community center be before you start your next project. This is really, really important. Failure to do so may result in aggravation and discipline. Our next meeting will be held next Wednesday, the 17th at 7.30, excuse me, at 9.30 <laughs> in the morning. I'm still in bed at 7.30. At 9.30 in the morning in the Sycamore Room. Hope to see you all there. I'd, I'd like to make a comment on that one also, uh, <clears throat> because as she said, we have a lot of uh, unauthorized alterations. And in many cases, it's because the resident talked to a contractor and the contractor said, you don't need a permit. I do this all the time. There's no problem. I'll just do it. And it's not. Don't do anything in your unit without talking to our alteration desk, seeing if a permit is needed, seeing if a city permit is needed, noting it in our stellar system that this was done or that was done so it's not a surprise to uh, the next resident who might be in that unit. It's very important that you uh, get permission instead of later on saying, I didn't know, my contractor said I could do it, looked pretty good to me. Please follow the rules. All right, our next uh, report is from the Communications Committee, Director Blackwell. Yes, uh, on, on Village Television in December, we have a, a spot every Friday morning on this day for United. Juanita Skillman gave us the update uh, for the United meeting. Steve Leonard talked about new translation technologies. Uh, Janie Durrell and Kurt Wyman <coughs> talked about the alteration processes. And I was on twice. I talked on landscaping once. And then last week, I talked on strategic planning. We have in the breeze, architecture, MNC, executive hearings, landscape, board business, United Appliance Information, committee schedule, and this month, an article by Jeff Beaumont, who writes an article for the breeze. Jeff explains this month what happens when a member dies. Additionally, there are informative topics from the other boards and from the VMS in the breeze. So please read the breeze. Please use your website, as Steve keeps telling you how to do, and become an informed citizen. Thank you. OK. And <clears throat> uh, D is the Executive Hearings Committee. Uh, the Executive Committee <clears throat> met. Uh, we had all-day session. We do three things. We do damage restoration uh, requests. We do disciplinary cases. And we have uh, fines. So uh, those are not open. Those are all um, confidential. But I have to say that compliance is doing a really, really good job of bringing us those issues. It's been a problem in the fast, the past that we have rules, but we don't enforce them. Now that we have a, com a compliance department that is helping us to enforce those rules, we are seeing more and more. And as we mentioned, or Brad mentioned this morning, uh, don't think that you're just going to get away with it. Nobody's going to notice it. Believe me, people notice. Our next meeting will be January 25th in the Willow Room. Governing Documents Committee. <clears throat> We uh, looked at a number of things this last month, and we'll be continuing those on for this next meeting that's coming up. <clears throat> we particularly looked at the anti-discrimination policy, which we will be voting on next month. And I encourage anybody that's interested in seeing the language in that uh, to please go online and read that. And we'll also, uh, we, we endorsed it coming forward to the board. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we had, uh, a we reviewed the log from resident services and we had asked Christine Spar to come to our meeting, which she did in December, to show us the logs that she keeps and the statistics for the resident services. And we also 
looked at how we are communicating uh, with uh, uh, various websites and how we can bring that <clears throat> more to our residents' notice because well, that was one of our goals in our strategic plan. We reviewed a report on guarantors. This was brought forward at last month's meeting. We can't vote on it until next month because there wasn't 30 days between the December and January meetings. But there was a chart on the history of guarantors. We had a report <clears throat> uh, how many individuals as guarantors for multiple properties. And <clears throat> we had a slide or two of the information that we, would, we presented last month when we looked at this as an, an item, and we will probably present those slides again next month when it comes up for a final vote. We discussed uh, at the request of Director Tibbetts uh, the minimum income requirement for a sharehold in United. Right now, <clears throat> going on county statistics, we are at the poverty level. We are not a low income housing group. We say that we are affordable. We try to have a medium income requirement. And that's why it was recommended that we uh, raise our minimum requirement from 30,000 to, I mean, 36,000 to 40,000 for the coming year. And we also had a consensus on eliminating guarantors, which is also part of that uh, that will be brought up next month for a final vote. Committee uh, discussed renewal fees. We uh, discussed also the privileges of membership in GRF as defined by GRF, which are different than uh, United. And we voted to, uh, asked to remove the fee table from the uh, resolutions and just refer to the current fee schedule. So it's not in a couple places and it doesn't get updated in one and it is updated in another. So we're working on that. And <clears throat> for our meeting that's coming up on January 22nd, we're going to review updated resale documents we're going to review communication piece for residents regarding trusts. This is one of the most misunderstood things that we do. We are not a, uh, a planning commission for your uh, estate. We're not an estate planning. We don't have the qualified personnel to do that, et cetera. And we get many, many requests now. It used to be just a simple, uh, here's my shareholder. I want to put my shareholder in my trust. Uh, and that's what we are qualified to do, and that's what we, we can do. But the questions and the uh, intricacies that are coming up on so many of that has been a real problem. So we're going to be looking at some of those guidelines. And we're also going to, again, look at the current election guidelines. There are also a couple of things that are coming out of Sacramento. In fact, our attorney, Mr. Beaumont, is in Sacramento today representing us at a Senate committee mm -hmm. where they want to pass a resolution uh, or state law re requiring inspection of balconies every single year. You can imagine what the cost of that would be to our community with well over 2,000 balconies. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's representing us on that today. The next committee report uh, <clears throat> is uh, maintenance and construction. And since, uh, oh, excuse me, landscape, don't want to forget landscape. It's landscape, it's landscape. Yes. Uh, this is in regard to guarantors. I thought the bylaw allows guarantors. And how can a resolution trump bylaw? We have, the resolutions have the ability in the bylaws to make recommendations for, for changes. So we're using resolution to override bylaw. Yes. Are we changing bylaw at all? No. 
We don't have to. I, I don't think that's legal that we use a resolution to change bylaws. Madam President, if I may. Steve? Our bylaws have a definition of what a guarantor is in the beginning of the bylaws. The bylaws do not confirm, confirm that guarantors must be allowed. It's to the option of the board. It's a policy decision. It is stated uh, that guarantors can help guarantee the purchase. Can. The end of, in the At the decision of the board. board. You can bring it up in closed session and get an answer from our council. Why is it everything has to be this kind of a, a discussion needs to be go to the closed session? Because this relate to I'm all sorry, the I'm sorry. You brought this up last month. Right. You read from the bylaws. Right. My opinion is you are under a misunderstanding of what the bylaws state. And I'm recommending that you get a clear and concise answer to your concern from our legal counsel. As being seated on the governing documents committee with Maggie and Juanita and having gone through this process, the bylaws, when they were restated, conformed a definitions table. Mm -hmm. Yes. It There's clearly a states that the board has the ability to allow guarantors, but is not obligated to. Did you say allow? Is not obligated to. So I would recommend that you take this up with legal counsel for a for a complete explanation of your concerns. All right, we're going to go forward to the Landscape Committee report. Thank Director you. Blackwell. Okay, we met on, our, let's see, we met on December 14th. Um, we did reinstate the three minute rule, I think. We tried it the meeting before without it, and one person uh, took about 25 minutes, so we found that that was not going to help us get through, so we had to reinstate, though we were a little <coughs> soft with it. <laughs> but so, so it will be still, will be a time limit with a soft edge. Okay. Um, I did say that the excess amount of leaves are expected after storms and strong winds, and you'll, saw, you'll see that they're out there again. There they are. We just got them cleaned up, and now they're all down again. Nature is not under our control and sometimes works against us. I commented that the residents outnumber our staff by thousands, and it would be ineffective to allow constant interaction between the two. We have like a hundred times more residents for each for each staffer, for each groundsman. So, so you just can't stop and chat with them or ask them to do special things. They really have far, far too much to do. So we ask once again that you get your request into the service center, please. Always welcome to have a, a, a suggestion at the service center, something you notice or something that you want done. Uh, we, the yellow stake program is going on strong. Um, we haven't decided on the red stake program yet. That will be under discussion. Bruce Hartley said the staff is tracking landscaping progress and the trend is going in the right direction. In United, about 3,000 work tickets were closed and work tickets in progress are currently less than 200. It is imperative that residents use the Resident Services Call Center to generate requests because that is how we direct and keep track of work. Workers provide services but are budgeted by task. The landscape areas in the village are divided into eight sections and are distributed amongst the supervisors. Your call will help us get the right work to the right supervisor. If you just stop them on the sidewalk, it won't happen that way. Um, 
One or two vac one of two vacant supervisor positions was filled. Um, we did have good news. We did have one of them filled. Uh, let's see, by a ten-year worker, Hernandez. I forget. I turned that page. Sorry. We did fill it with one person who's been with the village for 10 years working and very well liked and very successful and he got bumped up to just under Bruce Hartley. He will be a manager for landscaping and that's a very welcome change. Of course, we still have our favorites of um, Raul Arceo, we have Mike Swingholm, and we have Bob Marguette for trees, all of whom we feel in United are doing a great job for us. Uh, for now, landscape schedules are found on the website, in the breeze, and on village television. So please consult those. Uh, our next meeting will be February, Thursday, February 8th at 9 o'clock in the boardroom. And you're welcome to come, but don't expect to get 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next we'll have a report from... <clears throat> Maintenance and Construction Committee, and in <clears throat> Director Tibbetts' absence, Mr. Leonard is Vice Chair. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of last minute, so Don gave me his notes, and I will read from them and make my best efforts from my own recollections. Um, we discussed, once again, toilet supply line maintenance. Uh, we brought this up in the previous meeting. Um, uh, there was some concern about the uh, overall quality of the braided lines that we replace when uh, toilets are serviced. And these are checked uh, approximately every three years during normal maintenance uh, visits that all manners get. Um, as a matter of uh, principle, when an angle stop, which is the valve at the wall, is replaced due to corrosion, the supply line is also replaced. There were 37 replacements in 2017 compared to 282 in 2016. We've asked staff to look into a uh, braided uh, line, steel braided line that has metal uh, components at both ends. Currently we have a metal component now at the angle stop and there is a plastic twist that affixes to the toilet which can be removed by hand or altered. So we asked them to investigate the um, true six-sided that require a wrench, so less tampering from residents or guests. Wasteline remediation, um, this is an ongoing project. It is expected to go for another 12 years. It was, immediately, it was initially funded starting in 2006 with the work beginning in 2011, um, increases have increased uh, each of those years to the present. Uh, we are now running at a million and a half dollars in expense per year on this program, which is up 49% over the 2016 budgeting. To date, we have 63 buildings done under the 2017 budget. We expect for uh, some additional buildings to be uh, to have been accounted for by year end. It says here that they're expecting 75 additional buildings to be completed in 2018. Ernesto Munoz um, commented that due to the delay in the start of the program last year, and which was April 24th, he expects that we will spend the $1.5 million on the buildings we're doing this year to be completed sometime by August or September. And if the board wants to move forward to continue doing additional buildings in 2018, that this is a reserve funding <coughs> uh, item. So the board will, may take that up at a later date to do more than the number of buildings scheduled because it looks like they'll do all the work in two thirds of the time this year that is budgeted for the 1.5 million. It takes about three days to rely on a manor. Uh, initially, the waistline remediation was being done from the main sewer lines to the building itself 
and not the waistlines that are involved with each one of the manors. Now that um, has been changed so that when they go to the building, they not only do those laterals from the building to the main sewer lines, but they're doing all of the waistlines uh, that are attached to each unit. So each toilet or sink or drain or whatever it is, all of those are being epoxied simultaneously rather than in a two-step process. Walkway lighting comes up continually. Um, we reviewed the plan, for, um, the report from 2010, which was very comprehensive, and the committee decided to uh, make a recommendation to the board to hire an outside lighting consultant, U.S. Energy, who's already doing work within the community for both GRF and for Third, to give us a cursory evaluation of what they might think would be feasible to upgrade some of our lighting. Our lighting was originally intended to be directional along the walkways and was not intended ever intended to be the type of lighting that would be used in a commercial retail operation. So uh, that was the recommendation and that will, it should be very cost effective and should not uh, require very much funds Handyman services, we've already thoroughly discussed here today. And uh, reclaimed water, he asked me to touch upon. Uh, there is an $8.5 million <clears throat> project. Oh, We're going to have a report on that in just a minute. Oh, okay. Then I'll bypass that. Good. It'll save me a lot of reading. Um, and there is uh, a new energy committee. committee being formed for the entire village rather than having separate energy committees for the mutuals and for GRF. And uh, I was appointed to that today. And we have not met or had any official things to report, so that will be coming later. And finally, uh, I, um, I did some research into some additional parking, and I asked staff to look at cul-de-sac 9 and see if we could not add uh, indeed, uh, an additional four parking spaces with some restriping, and staff came back and confirmed that. So, good news for all of you in cul de sac 9. There will be four more unassigned striped parking spaces sometime in the near future. And that's the report. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Dave Chapman. Dave, if you'll come up to the lectern. Uh, He's going to give us a report from the El Toro Water District. He's an active member of the Community Activities Group, CAG, attends all their quarterly meetings, uh, is a United resident, and basically kind of uh, gets the information that we need and brings it back to us. So, uh, <clears throat> Dave, if you'll give us a, a report on what's happening with the reclaimed water. Thank you, Madam President. By the way, my name is Dave Chambers. But oh, I'm that, sorry. You, you, can call, you can call me anything you want. So it's not late for lunch. <clears throat> I'm a resident of United in uh, Unit uh, 724A, and uh, I'm also a registered civil engineer in California and several other places. Uh, I've been going to these meetings of the El Toro Water District for a couple of years now. I find them an interesting and very uh, capable and qualified district, and I think that uh, we're lucky to have them. The, you may know that they are have been working for several years in, uh, in putting in reclaimed water lines throughout much of the village. The, uh, presently, they are working on an area in uh, third that is uh, in, in a, around gate nine, and uh, that will complete all of the work in United, I'm sorry, in uh, third that is north of El Toro. They are, then that, that last contract in, in, uh, in the area of Gate 9 has been uh, underway now for a couple of months. Uh, they've done some preliminary work and they will be getting to laying pipe in that area pretty soon. The, uh, they are now into a, a first unit in United, which is the part of United that is north of of uh, El Toro and at, at Gate 5. And this will probably be the only work 
in, in these two jobs will probably be the only work that they do in the village. Uh, the, uh, the rest of the project is south of El Toro, and there are a lot of problems with going south, including crossing El Toro Boulevard itself. It was quite a project to get the pipeline constructed from the plant to the uh, west side of Moulton Parkway. And there, there is also a, a capacity question as to whether or not they have enough uh, reclaimed water to serve all of these areas. Also, they have a, uh, a, um, a uh, what am I trying to say? They're, uh, oh, well, the, they also probably will not be able to serve it, not only because of the barrier of El Toro Boulevard itself, but because all the water lines that they've done so far, they don't have capacity in those lines to serve uh, the, any more area south of El Toro. This is not really a, a problem in that uh, the, the project as a whole, the whole village gets a benefit out of using the, uh, uh, the golf course, for example, and, and this was a big thing that got the project started to convert all of that to reclaimed water from potable water, which was a good move. And by, by now, all of, almost all of Unite of Third will be served by landscaping. Uh, the landscaping will serve all of the area of, of Third and this small amount of, uh, of United, which is in, in the Gate 5 area. The, uh, the district is working well with the people. Uh, you know, putting in a pipeline messes up a lot of things and is a great inconvenience. But they are, their progress process is to trench and install pipe in, in one day, and there will be no exposed trench ever. They, they uh, communicate well with the visitors, with the residents of the area where they're going to put pipe. And so these people are known that, for instance, on Wednesday of next week, you cannot park in this street. You have to park someplace else, but will be done on that day. They, they really have a, a very good public relations uh, uh, program. And uh, I, I, I think if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Okay. Are there any questions from the board? Raisa? Uh, can you give us some <coughs> idea of how do they reclaim the water, the wastewater? The, the reclamation project is a standard uh, process of, of uh, you know, all of the uh, junky stuff, if you will, goes to the plant that's down there just west of, uh, of uh, Clubhouse 4. And it all winds up there, and that's segregated into solids and liquids, and the liquids are, the solids are hauled off, and you may see their big truck hauling off uh, three or four, four trips a day every day of the week. The, the liquids, though, are treated, and they're not treated to a level that be, makes the water potable, but it, it is treated enough to be used safely for landscaping, even though you can't get your hose and, and drink out of it. Uh, but it, it's, uh, uh, and uh, there was another point I was going to make, but uh, I, I don't know if I've satisfactorily explained your question. Uh, I, I cannot explain the process. I just know that it is processed. Yeah, thank you. I, I understood uh, how they're doing it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'd also mention that El Toro Water has a great website, and they have videos on that website that explain all of this, and they also have maps, and they keep you up to date on what areas they are working on at any given time. And so if you're really interested in the Reclaimed Water Project, I ask you to go and look on their website. But thank you, Dave. I appreciate your sharing that with us. And we'll see you again next quarter. OK. All right, the last report is the Resident Advisory Committee. And since uh, Mr. Tibbetts isn't here at the moment, um, <clears throat> Director Agricar, you're the co-chair. Do you have anything to report? He didn't tell me anything specific. <laughs> I have his next notes. Meeting is on 
<laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Steve has some notes from uh, Director Tibbetts. His wife had surgery, and he had to go pick her up, and he will be back for our closed session this afternoon. So <coughs> Don's notes are, we had two concerns last month and gave direction to residents involved. This is an important committee for residents to get answers or directions they need in many areas of the village. If you have a question or concern and cannot find a satisfactory answer, attend our next meeting. And he has the next meeting date as January 18th at 3 p.m. <coughs> That's all. I not sure that's right. I'll have to double check that. <clears throat> the next meeting of the Resident Advisory Committee. I thought it was this Thursday. Usually. We had gone they, to Wednesday did, and we went back to Thursday. They contacted me about changing it. <clears throat> okay, so it's the third <coughs> Thursday. All right. That's a change. It already been for. Okay. All right. Thank so you. January 18th at 3 p.m. All right. January 18th at 3 p.m. All right. Uh, very quickly, let's go through GRF committee highlights. Uh, as a reminder, every GRF committee has representatives from all of the mutuals. We have two members on that committee. Third has two members on that committee. Uh, the Towers has one member on the committee. And GRF has three members. They chair the committee. <clears throat> basically a chair and, and two members. And so, um, <clears throat> Director Morrison, a report on the Finance Committee. I don't know how fast this is going to be. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. We discussed the trust facilities fee, and I'm going to kind of go into that because I know a lot of people have been questioning why it went from 2500 to 5000 it is a key source of revenue for reserves planning and improvement and helps keep monthly assessment costs down as a result of buyers contributing to the reserves at the time that they purchase through the resale process. Um, in 2016, there was a waiver removed stating that the buyer um, could was negated from, from having to pay another fee if they did it in the same year. And then this caused abuse of investors and flippers. So <clears throat> there's been a suggested amendment uh, where at least one of the purchasers has paid a trust facilities fee to the Golden Rain Foundation Trust prior to the close of escrow and the purchase of separate interest. The trust facilities fee herein will be reduced by the amount of the trust facilities fee previously paid if both of the following are satisfied. Number one, the manner for which the prior trust facilities fee was paid constitutes the purchaser's primary residence for six months uh, to entering the escrow on the newly purchased manor and the newly purchased manor constitutes the purchaser's primary residence for six months following the close of escrow on another manor. Now, concerns. If property is held for more than a year, the profit on the property is taxed at a lower rate, so flippers will often keep the property for 366 days. So if the board wants to com combat this scenario um, of subparagraph 2, um, we might need to require the purchaser to live in a newly purchased unit for a time uh, beyond a year. So if the purchaser violates that and moves out of the community, the board may incur costly collection actions to pursue the waived fee. So the board might consider charging the fee and refunding it once the, the conditions are met. Inserting the requirement that residents live in the community for a reasonable time prior to purchasing a new manor or for a reasonable time after purchasing the new manor could allow a GRF to determine what is reasonable. So we need to be careful to avoid subjective standards that open the door to claims of prejudice. 
Trust facility fee policy, effective January the 1st, 2018, and closing any closings on or before March 31st, 2018 are deemed transactions occurring prior to the effective date of January 1st. Effective January 1st, the trust facilities fee shall be set at $5,000 for units with a sales price of $75,000 or higher and $2,500 for units that sell below $75,000. This fee can be paid in its entirety at the time of transfer or the fee um, amount pursuant to an installment payment plan for a period of seven years. A one-time fee of $252 will uh, be subjected to that until modified um, and, and that's for uh, preparation of a promissory note. Um, Next, uh, the TV uh, programming and social media were discussed, and I would suggest that people attend the meeting that's going to be Wednesday at 4.30 in this room, and it'll be presented by Chuck Holland, and he will be able to answer any of your questions, and um, I think enlighten probably all of us um, the GRF facilities and trust funds appropriations were 19,555,511 incurred to date, and incurred to date was 12,721,214, so we have a remaining encumbrance of 6,257,616. Um, the ID card fee was discussed, and United is now at $25, and Third is replacing their ID card fee and it will also be $25. Our next meeting is going to be February the 21st, 2018, 1.30 in the boardroom. Thank you. <clears throat> the next committee is the Community Activities Committee. Director Durrell. Thank you. Recreation Department is sponsoring free monthly movies at the Performing Arts Center starting January the 15th at 7.30. They also are inviting you to come and celebrate Chinese New Year on January the 20th at the Performing Arts Center at 6.30 p.m. And the Recreation Department is offering 13 new fitness classes. And our next CAC meeting will be January the 11th at 2 p.m. in the boardroom here in the community center. Thank you. Uh, the Maintenance and Construction Committee, Director Leonard. First, I'd just like to say, Gary, great job. Yeah. Glad I didn't have to give that report. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let me preface this by saying that in 2017, there were a total of 30 completed projects in GRF in M&C. Currently, there are, these are the most recent due to have been completed between December of last year and March of this year, so I'll just run through those real quick. Um, Clubhouse One had a refurbishment uh, which was supposed to be completed in December of various blinds, kitchen flooring, card room flooring, and exterior doors. Village Greens is uh, projected to be finished by the end of this month with some new flooring and some paint touch-up. The Historical Society is due for HVAC replacement by the end of this month. Pool number two by the end of this month is due for a new filter and heater. Pool four by the end of this month also for a filter heater plus replaster and waterline tile replacement. Pool six by the end of this month, um, all of the above that I just cited for pool four. Clubhouse seven by the end of this month, uh, main, main lounge refinish of the wood floor. Club seven by the end of February is to have the bridge floor, it's on hold until the kitchen renovation is done. Clubhouse 4, um, 118, and Clubhouse 6, 318 also are up for some additional refurbishments. Lawn bowling is due to have all the replaced greens um, 
completed by the end of February of this year. The work has already begun. And the 19th restaurant remodel is currently out for bid. Pickleball and paddle tennis are ongoing, and we will have the corporate members meeting coming up to discuss that at length and in greater detail. The next meeting is for the GRF maintenance and committee. Uh, maintenance and construction is scheduled for Valentine's Day, February 14th. And that concludes my report. Thank you. All right, our next report is from the Media and Communications Committee. Director Blackwell. Uh, the Media and Communications Committee has been involved in making decisions about what steps to take to move our technology into Century 21. Uh, we're having a town hall at 4.30. Please come or watch it. Uh, it will be on internet access, broadband, and all kinds of other things. More and more is added every day. I just heard a new addition to it today. So it is a growing, it should be a very interesting town hall meeting. Put your good hearing aids in for that one. Uh, staff and mutuals are working on uh, an updated new member orientation video. In fact, we will have a meeting on January 12th at two o'clock on the Willow to go over the um, script for that and see if we can get a new orientation video done. Thrive is coming up on January 18th at 9 a.m. That's a Thrive program which shows Village TV, which shows how residents make friends, join new activities, and develop new hobbies in the village. So there's a lot of filming going on and interviewing. So you can watch Thrive on TV. We have had discussions on the various advertisements, announcements, and articles that can be put out through television, through shows, advertisements, email blasts, the globe, and the breeze. And we're still working on things. We're having our breeze meeting January 24th at 11.30. Our GF media and communications meeting is January 15th at 1.30. So there is a communications meeting of some kind. We have about four meetings a month. So we're very busy trying to communicate to everybody and, and update things. Thank you. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next is the report from the uh, Mobility and Vehicles Committee. That's Director Akrakar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, um, our security has been cleaning up our RV lots quite a bit. Um, in all total, there were 19 violations uh, in the traffic committee the other day. And although we showed leniency wherever possible, uh, almost everyone was fined to a certain extent. Primarily, uh, reasons uh, are speeding and uh, not stopping at the stop signs. Uh, <clears throat> next meeting is scheduled February 7th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Security and Community Access Committee. Uh, <clears throat> Pat, do you have anything to say on that? Since you're the code, you're the other person on directive, it's just not. <laughs> Sorry, Here. I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> oh, you have his notes? <laughs> oh, Steve will have everything, of course. Okay, all right, John. <laughs> well, he handed me all his notes before he left. Default to Steve. <laughs> Let's see what he says. Um, we have a concern about a local church asking parishioners to invite oh, homeless oh, to stay yes. with them until they can get on their feet. This is definitely not a position that the village has taken and staff is contacting the appropriate individuals. We are concerned about the growing homeless pop problem, but we do not support inviting homeless to live in the village. We, um, a few have been found wandering around our carports in the evening. Security is working on new and different decals. This is a GRF responsibility. Don will keep you up to date. Number one call for the past three years to security was for inside falls by a resident. Number one crime, this is for petty theft. On an investigation, many of the items were just misplaced. The next meeting is January 18th at 1.30 p.m. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, and I think, Director Akrakar, you already talked about the traffic hearings, so we put that together with that. Very good. All right. Future agenda items. There are uh, four agenda items for our February meeting. Three of them were introduced in December and had the first reading in December, but we could not vote on them at our January meeting since there was not 30 days. So they are still open. If you have any uh, uh, feelings or add they want to or uh, want to enter to interact with the board, give us your pros, cons, whatever on these. And I'm going to ask our secretary just to read the <clears throat> excuse me the resolution attached to them, not all of the rest of the information, which is on last week month's agenda. Agenda. Okay, this is resolution 0117XX financial qualifications policy. Whereas it is in the best interest of the corporation to protect and preserve the financial integrity of the corporation, whereas selling prices within the village are within the county's affordable housing limits, and whereas guarantors in the committee have increased and some have been allowed to guarantee multiple units with the same sources of income and asset requirements. Now therefore be it resolved December 12 or whenever that the board of directors of this corporation hereby introduces amendments to financial qualifications policy, including the minimum income requirement for prospective shareholders and transferees is increased from 36,000 to 40,000 and the ability to qualify in United with a guarantor is eliminated. Resolve further that staff is hereby directed to disseminate this information to the realty community serving Laguna Woods Village, and resolve further that resolution 0117134 is hereby superseded and canceled and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. Should the board endorse the proposed revolutions? Oh, it's put over to February 13. 13th. Thank you. <coughs> the second one is the anti-discrimination policy. A resolution 0117XX, whereas United Laguna Woods Mutual is a nonprofit mutual benefit corporation existing under and by virtue of the laws of the state of California, organized for the purpose of providing its members with senior housing on a cooperative nonprofit basis, pursuant to provisions set forth in its occupancy agreement, articles of incorporation, and bylaws. Whereas United, through its volunteer board of directors, is responsible for management, maintenance, and administration of a residential stock cooperative common interest development under United's governing documents, which include, without limitation, occupancy agreement, articles of incorporation bylaws, or operating rules and board resolutions, which grant United the authority to manage and govern the affairs of the properties within United and all applicable law. Whereas California Civil Code Section 4760A2 provides in part that a member may modify his or her separate interest at his or her expense to facilitate access for persons who are blind, visually handicapped, deaf or physically disabled, or to alter conditions which could be hazardous to those persons. The modifications may also include modifications of the route from the public way to the door of the separate interest. Whereas federal law prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, familial status, and disability, Whereas federal law also provides that discrimination includes the refusal to permit at the expense of the handicapped person reasonable modif modifications of existing premises occupied or to be occupied by such person if such modifications may be necessary to avoid such person full enjoyment of the premises. Whereas California law prohibits the owner of any housing 
accommodation to discriminate against or harass any person because of the race, color, religion, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, ancestry, familial status, source of income, disability, or gener genetic information of that person. Whereas California law also permits the owner of any housing accommodation to make or to cause to be made any written or oral inquiry concerning the race, color, religion, sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, ancestry, familial status, disability, or genetic information of any person seeking to purchase, rent, or lease any housing accommodations. Two, any person to make, print, or publish, or to cause to be made, printed, or published, any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a housing accommodation that indicates any preference limitation or discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, ancestry, familial status, source of income, disability or genetic information, or in an intention to make that preference limitation or discrimination. And three, to otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling based on discrimination because of race, color, religion, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, familial status, source of income, disability, genetic information, or national origin. Whereas Article 3 of the Articles of Incorporation provides that United shall have and exercise any and all powers, rights, and privileges which a cor corporation organized under the Nonprofit Mutual Benefit Corporation law may now or hereafter have or exercise. Whereas Section 1 and 2 of the bylaws provides that United has express power and duty to manage, maintain, preserve, and administer the business of the development and to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the residents within the development. Whereas the board has the power to adopt, amend, or repeal at its discretion rules and regulations not inconsistent with the provisions of the governing documents respectively. And whereas United desires to strengthen, clarify, and confirm its anti-discrimination policy pursuant to applicable law. Now, therefore, be it resolved December 12th. February 13th. February 13th, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces the anti-discrimination policy and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. <laughs> and the third one is Section 43, bathroom splits. This is a little different. Whereas the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend alteration standards and create new alteration standards as necessary, whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee has reviewed numerous variance requests to remodel bathrooms, specifically to create a second bathroom in the footprint of the original bathroom. This type of alteration is commonly referred to as a bathroom split. And whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to create a new standard for these alterations, eliminating the need for members to apply for a variance request for a common alteration, now therefore be it resolved December whatever or February that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces the following standard section 43 of the alteration standards for bathroom splits. I don't think you need to. Would you like? No, no. I may. All oh, right. Thank you. Go to the back. <laughs> Hello? Yes. I would like to know, uh, Maggie, since we are required to abide by federal and state laws, 
why we have to go through this anti-discrimination thing, because we're required by state law in any case. So why we should put anything on our books and read all that stuff, I, I just think it's a waste of time. That's a good question, but I think it is just so that we can say we do follow the same laws as we are required to, and we are aware of what they are. So this is to stave off anyone's criticizing us for not knowing or not caring or not being interested in protecting the rights of our people. Thank you. <clears throat> We're also um, on the future agenda Wait, for the February 13th meeting. Lori. Lori. I would just, sorry, real quick, I would like to say that um, these resolutions for the community, the, these resolutions are on the website and they are <coughs> under the meeting that they were introduced at. Which and they December. are also in a paper copy just outside on the concierge desk so people can come and look at them there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Is it necessary to have her read this whole resolution? It's not even attached here as an exhibit. Can't she just refer to the topic and not go through this whole process? Because nobody's going to remember what she says or even understand it. Is that required? No, it's not. It's Why in the interest of transparency for our television audience and the people who do not have uh, agenda packets. Uh, just to say, this is what we're going to be doing. These future agenda items, they need to know what they are. And they don't remember from one month to another. So it's strictly uh, a courtesy of transparency to our, our residents who are not in attendance. And we also, at our February 13th meeting, will introduce an ordinance regarding access to Unite to uh, United Mutual Records. Now we'll go to director comments. What about D? There was a D here as well. That's what I just said. I'm oh, sorry, I missed it. We what will introduce a motion to introduce an ordinance regarding access to United Records. We will take this up at our February 13th meeting. Oh, February 13th. Yeah, none of these are for discussion today. They're just information because we always tell our residents you have 30 days, in this case it was 60 days, to contact us with your views, your letters, your emails, your calls, whatever. Uh, and we just want to remind them because there's nothing I hate more than having a meeting go by and have somebody say, I didn't know this was up. Nobody told me you were doing this. And that's why we reiterate a number of times what it is that we're working on and what we're going to vote on. All right, it's time for uh, director's comments. Uh, Manny, would you, Manuel, would you like to start? <coughs> The only comment I want to repeat is that um, I don't understand why we have to go through the whole reading of the... It, we could just put a reference in here in the description yeah. without going through that whole process. So that's the only comment I have to offer. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Director Akakar? Yes. Um, as a realtor broker, I went through some of the properties in our community, and I see that some realtor purchased a property put some $27,000 upgrades in it, and then relisted it for 216000 plus. I mean, the whole objective of the community is to have affordable senior living. I think we are missing that point, and we need to have some kind of uh, real estate policing or something <laughs> so that we don't get these absorbently high real estate prices just because. Of course, there's no control. You can sell anything. But I think the main objective of our community is to have a senior, affordable, living community, which is being missed. Thank you. I appreciate that. But as I mentioned before, it's a seller's market, and they can do whatever they want with it. Andre? <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm... Uh kind of ultimately dismayed by this guarantor eliminated from... Uh, We're not this. going to discuss that here. Andre, that comes Sorry, at the next meeting. Sorry, it's my time to comment. I can not comment. Not as a director's comment. This, the debate on that will be at the February I'm meeting. not talking about this uh, uh, debate. I'm just commenting <laughs> on this issue, okay? 
And this is a discrimination to the immigrant community because their parents don't have the source of income to prove they have uh, the meet the requirements that provide them an alternative to prove to uh, move into this uh, community. And even though they have, may have sufficient fund, but they just cannot meet the requirement because some legal requirements here. And also, in the same time, this is the first time I ever heard that bylaws can be overridden because it's just an optional. Bylaws is law. When it states like this, it needs to be enforced rather than be interpreted as an optional. So I am totally against this uh, guarantor. And uh, I think that we, the board needs to follow the laws. The board cannot just say, we think everything else is optional, and it's our decision to override everything else. Thank when you the bylaws much. say it is optional, we do have that break, and the bylaws do say it is optional. <laughs> Pat? Well, I probably could say a whole lecture on <laughs> things today, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to pass. Thank you. Janie? I have no comment. Hmm? Maggie? Uh, the wording of the bylaws is up for interpretation by the attorney. The attorney seems to think that he is correct. I don't know if you wish to engage another attorney, feel free to question the board's attorney. Uh, but just for you yourself, uh, holding no legal title that I know of, uh, I would say it would be unwise to go against the board's attorney. You can always ask him more about it, and that's OK. As to the question of guarantors and what it means, we also must balance that with risks for the development, risks for United. This is not up for day, debate at this time, right? So Maggie. that's right. OK. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Gary? I want to say that laws are constantly changed. They're not static. And then I want to also say that I think it was a very informative meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Raisa? Yeah, I have several <coughs> questions or comments. One is uh, on closed meetings, why it's not close to the board only? We have to have legal, VMS, etc., to be there. Why? I'm not sure what your question is. At a closed board meeting, we always have our legal attorney. Yeah, we've had it, but why? Because that's what closed sessions are for. No, but why? Isn't, do you think the board are not uh, qualified to make their own decision, the board members? Closed meetings generally deal with points of law in regarding certain issues, and that is why the attorney is there, is to clarify our, our points uh, of attorney, law. Attorney, I understand. Yeah, sometimes we need them. But you see, as we have Steve here, he can uh, comment on everything, so we don't need an attorney, unless the ser serious this is yeah. this <laughs> is <laughs> this is right out and of it's order. not a der uh, okay. derogatory remark against any right. of your fellow directors why do we have vms there even when we are discussing we their agreement can we cannot discuss their agreement when they are present over <laughs> okay uh, any other comments steve yeah no <coughs> I also want to know when the a chair decides to remove somebody from that committee, why doesn't she have to give any uh, reason? All right, I, your comment is taken well, but I believe she did give you some reasons. Yes, the reason all right, that's is all not that acceptable. We need to say. <clears throat> Do you want the reasons published and argued over? No, no, I want to see the reason because it may go out to globe sometime and then it will escalate another issue. Okay, you have another issue? Another comment? <clears throat> yeah, if you are sick, for example, and 
you give a notice that you are sick, but the other person doesn't receive it, uh, should you be punished for that? In what context? We don't punish people for being sick. She did. Uh, Director Doran. She no, put these, me these... out of her committee because I called her 6, 10, 13 in the morning. I said I was sick. I'm then sorry. Said, Point of order. This yes. is director's comments. comments. This is not discussion of internal board issues. That's we correct. Legal, uh, our legal is commenting on everything now, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> All right, do you have any other comment? If not, Steve, any comments? Happy National Bubble Bath Day. Hey. <laughs> He's always got a good one for us. All right, I recess this meeting to our closed meeting. <laughs>